surfaces, but those are pretty much pointed back down towards Earth. Um, our next question wanted to know, how does the communication to Dragon work? Is it done through satellites? Partially, yes. Um, if you think about the International Space Station orbiting Earth, uh, it technically is considered a satellite as well as a spaceship. Really big one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then we also have ground stations uh, across the world that are able to provide uplinks and downlinks from the station, uh, as well as from Dragon Capsule itself. So uh, we try to make all of those connections as, as direct as possible to us here in Mission Control, you know, for uh, trying to reduce latency and making sure that we get high quality feeds. So we try to avoid ping ponging as much as possible. Uh, but yeah, there, there are ways. Uh, but generally speaking, we go from capsule to ground in as short of a distance as possible. All right. Our next one comes from Juliet, who wants to know, does NASA have a full size mock up of the space station in a training facility? We have several, actually. Uh, we have a building called the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility uh, in, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston where we have uh, a full-size mock-up of every single habitable module. So that's essentially saying every single module you can actually go inside. Uh, there's a huge part of the space station itself that's just external, that isn't pressurized, and the astronauts only really see when they're spacewalking. So to familiarize them with that part, we have a full-size mock-up in the bottom of our swimming pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, a 40-foot deep pool. They practice how to spacewalk. Uh, so we have several, and they're typically of kind of different fidelity is what we call them. So you'll have some that have real racks, real science hardware, real you know oxygen generation system built in. And then you'll have some that are just kind of representative of them. They'll be full size, but they might have uh, like a printed poster of what's on the wall here. But you can still use things like that for emergency training. We, we really try to do as much training on the ground. And I know we do the same in Dragon in something that's lifelike for what they're about to be flying on once they're in space. So by the time that they get there, a lot of your actions just feel like reflex. So at this point, we're going to check in on Dragon. Looks like it is about to go over Eastern Europe. Uh, we're going to show our uh, ground track here and allow you to follow along. Uh, we still have, let me check my timer here. We still have two hours and one minute until our major milestone uh, begins. That will be the claw separation and preparation to uh, jettison the trunk. Again, that's coming up in two hours and one minute at 10.51 a.m. Pacific or 18.51 Universal. So uh, stay with us and enjoy watching Dragon traverse the Earth.
Hex Dragon for inventory after fluid loading. Okay, SpaceX is ready to copy fluid uh, inventory after fluid loading. Okay, from location 10, uh, two additional bottles were consumed from two o bag 207 and one from bag 206. So that leaves uh, 208 empty, 207 empty, and 206 with two remaining. From location nine, three bottles were consumed from 203. So that leaves uh, 203 and 204 as empties. Everything else is per the packing plan. Okay, thanks for the update. Looks like bag 207 consumed two bottles, 206 consumed one bottle. 208, 207 are empty, and 206 has two remaining. And then from location nine, we copy um, two bottles from 203, I believe, and that means 203 and 204 empty, the rest per packing plan. From location 9, 203 and 204 are empty, and everything else is per the packing plan. Okay, copy location 9, correction, uh, 203 and 204 empty, the rest in location 9 per the packing plan. Good, we're back. And uh, just one more sanity check, Bob. Could you just tell us the total number of bottles uh, consumed? Let me uh, try to do the math from my uh, notes here. I believe since departing station, we've uh, consumed 13 bottles. Okay, copy, 13 bottles. Uh, we'll uh, reconcile our records down here and let you know if we got any questions. Uh, thanks very much. Solo, and we're about to close out uh, locations nine and ten and be suited, and so it's uh, not going to be practical to go back and re-inventory anything if there's uh, any questions after about uh, three minutes. So um, please let us know if you can uh, early. Okay, copy. And actually, we do have a question for location uh, ten, uh, bag two zero six. Can you please uh, read back the quantity there remaining? Okay, let me uh, unstow that bag. It looks like uh, I made a mistake. I thought they had three bottles in each one, and I just reported one was uh, removed. So I'll have to unstow the bag to count the quantity inside of 206. We have a pretty good readout, Bob, that 206 started at uh, five bottles. So if you uh, know you took two out of there, we can uh, call that one three. No, from 206, we took a single bottle out. So uh, let me count them for you. Okay, thanks for that double check.
in location 206, there are four bottles remaining. Okay, four bottles remaining in 206. That math makes better sense to us. Appreciate it.
All right, well, we are still just getting closer and closer to things really picking up as Bob and Doug get ready to hit the final phase of their flight back to Earth in the end of this Demo 2 mission. Still have a couple of milestones to go, but I mean, everything picked up when we departed the space station yesterday, and it's been a pretty smooth ride so far. So everything really kicked off back on Saturday as on their 62nd day on board the International Space Station and their 63rd day in space, Bob and Doug began to get the capsule ready for their ride home. Everything picked up when they uh, got all of the final cargo into the Dragon capsule and then got themselves in and then closed that hatch. Uh, crawling in through the top hatch to the Dragon spacecraft, getting suited up shortly thereafter. Meanwhile, on the station side, Station Commander Chris Cassidy closed the A-pass hatch, creating what is known as the vestibule, a space between the two hatches that would be exposed to vacuum following undocking. Then we use valves on the Dragon side to draw the air out of that vestibule in a depressurization step bringing it down to vacuum and getting it ready for that eventual physical separation or undocking. After that was complete, the teams down here on the ground, both in MCCX right behind us in Hawthorne and in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston did a go-no-go -no -go for undocking, making sure everything was good with systems on board Dragon and the health of the International Space Station. Following that go-no-go, no go, we had a successful separation with Dragon using Draco thrusters around its service section to physically separate from the International Space Station. After hooks had driven back that were holding it in place, it executed those two quick burns. Then it was on to four departure burns spread over a number of hours, initially taking Dragon up and over the International Space Station, which brought it behind, and then after it lowered its orbit beneath the station, eventually bringing it out in front. Front. Uh, following all of those successful departure burns, it was just about time for the crew uh, to get some sleep. Uh, and actually during their sleep period, we were able to do what's known as the departure phasing burn. Uh, it's a little off in this timeline as it actually switched in the Mid final dragon. hours leading uh, up uh, of that departure. Dragon SpaceX, we have you loud and clear for suited comm check. I read you the same. Just pausing that timeline as the crew in their suit up steps, they just did a comm check. Um, so they have communications run through the umbilical in their seats directly into their suits where they're able to maintain that conversation with the ground. We heard uh, a little bit of chatters a few minutes ago as they were finishing up that fluid loading. Again, that's done to help with uh, combating orthostatic intolerance. And to put it simply, that's dizziness um, in most people. Uh, fluid loading can actually help uh, your body react to uh, what's typically a, a rush of blood away from the head once you get back down in a gravity environment, which can make you extremely dizzy. Um, so fluid loading, you can actually up the amount of plasma in your blood, um, and that just helps kind of minimize that. They're also wearing what's known as an orthostatic garment, um, ex essentially compression pants that's squeezing their legs and forcing some of that fluid from the legs up towards the upper part of their body. So everything's continuing to proceed. They're suited up inside Dragon uh, for the second time in the last 24 hours as we get ready for this deorbit. Yeah, there on your screen, you can see a shot of our Mission Control Center here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Those folks there are uh, our Dragon operators, they are technical experts that continue to monitor the data and telemetry coming down from Dragon, uh, not only about the vehicle, but of the crew themselves, uh, continuing to make sure that everything is going well and just making sure that we are green or go to step into uh, the next major milestones that we have coming up. Uh, at this point, we're about an hour and a half away from that. Um, those milestones will begin with uh, the claw separation, which is when we initiate the, the jettison of the trunk. Uh, in order to expose the heat shield underneath the capsule, uh, we need to let the trunk uh, go away. So we separate the two. That trunk will actually re-enter the Earth's 
excuse me, the uh, the trunk will actually re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and it'll disintegrate upon doing so. Oh, we got our nice little animation back here, so I'll toss it back over to Dan. Yeah, we did that departure phasing burn. That's what really kind of set us up on our pathway towards where we are today. And then the crew did have a sleep period. Is Again, this is about a 19-hour phasing or a 19-hour trip. Uh, from the station to the splashdown. And then as Kate was saying, it was on to, we're almost up to claw and trunk separation. Yeah, so at 10.51 a.m. Pacific or 18.51 United time, or Universal time, uh, we will have that claw and trunk separation, which like I said before, will basically allow us to expose the heat shield and prepare us to execute the deorbit burn. The deorbit burn is intended to place Dragon on its final trajectory to its landing zone, which as we have mentioned before, before it's determined to be off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, the deorbit burn will last about 11 and a half minutes. After doing so, we will close and lock the nose cone. Uh, we do this in order to protect the forward hatch located there at the top of the capsule. Uh, and, we're, and we do that after the deorbit burn because the thrusters located there uh, in the forward bulkhead are what we use to uh, actually perform the deorbit burn. So once that nose, nose cone is closed, we enter a six minute long communication blackout. Uh, this is because we are re-entering the atmosphere. As we encounter that atmosphere and friction builds up, plasma builds up on the external sides of the capsule, uh, creating a barrier essentially where we can't command the capsule or receive telemetry. However, Dragon is completely autonomous, so totally fine. It's driving itself by, it's driving itself at that point anyway. So. Uh, we will then, that, like I said, that blackout period lasts for six minutes. A couple minutes after that, we will deploy the drogue parachutes. Drogue parachutes are used to, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to help slow the uh, vehicle down further before we deploy the main parachutes, as well as to stabilize the vehicle. A couple minutes, about a minute after the drogue parachute deployment, we will deploy the four main parachutes. Uh, if you watched our demo one splashdown, those are big, beautiful orange and white white parachutes, and those further decelerate the vehicle down to a mere 15 or 16 miles per hour. That's the speed that they'll be going when they splash down in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we're targeting just off the uh, east coast of Florida near Pensacola. Once splashdown is confirmed and we cut the main parachutes uh, away so they, don't, uh, uh, so they don't pull the capsule, recovery operations begin immediately. So that entails uh, essentially going, getting the, uh, the vessel, excuse me, the, getting the capsule out of the water and lifting it onto the recovery vessel. Uh, and once that is all secure, we open the hatch and we get our first glimpse of Bob and Doug uh, back here on planet Earth for the first time since they launched on Falcon nine back in late May. So that particular moment will be the first time there they get to breathe fresh air uh, and we're looking forward to getting some thumbs up from them whenever we see them exit the capsule. And everything's lining up for an on-time splashdown and recovery. We've been following the progress of Go Navigator as it makes its way out to the recovery zone. Uh, it left its port in Pensacola just a few hours ago, and we're tracking that it should be arriving on station uh, just about at the top of this current hour. So it'll be there in advance of all of the upcoming uh, hardware milestones where we get into trunk step and everything like that. So it'll be there and ready uh, with the operational teams a little over over 40 personnel on board from SpaceX and NASA ready to assist in the recovery of the capsule and getting Bob and Doug home. Yeah. So as those mission controllers there in our mission control center here, just to my left, uh, continue to monitor Dragon's health. Uh, we continue to monitor Twitter uh, for your questions. We're using the hashtag AskNASA and we're trying to get through to as many questions as possible this morning. Our next question comes to us from Jackie. Uh, the question is, what is the name of the Dragon recovery vessel that's sailing to the splashdown location? Great question, uh, especially because we actually have two. The one that we are utilizing today is Go Navigator. This recovery ship is for all of our west coast, or excuse me, of all of the 
splashdown locations on the west coast of Florida. So any potential splashdown location uh, in the Gulf of Mexico is serviced by Go Navigator. For our East Coast landing sites, uh, which we, are, we will not be attempting today, we use Go Searcher. Both the Go Navigator and the Go Searcher are identical. They have, full, excuse me, they have a fully functional uh, recovery platform as well as medical bays. So it's really nice that we're able to assist uh, the departure process, so departing the International Space Station. It's really great that we're able to assist that departure process by allowing for more opportunities for departure by having more landing sites. So uh, today we are using Go Navigator, and it departed for the landing zone about two and a half hours ago, I think at this point, uh, and it is en route to the designated landing zone uh, just off the coast of Pensacola. All right, and our next question comes from Takur, who wanted to know, what's the importance of inventory check during the splashdown? Uh, if you were just listening a few minutes ago, you heard uh, Bob and Doug going through a, a wide range of inventory checks, and a lot of it was their food and water, particularly the water as they had just completed that fluid loading. Um, as we've talked about a few times today, we have to meticulously track every single item in for, on a spacecraft um, for the obvious reasons, like if an astronaut needs to find it, it helps to know where it is. Um, but, and then for some of the less obvious reasons, like we have to track where everything is, and if something is missing in a spacecraft, you have to kind of halt work once it's back on the ground and make sure you find it. Um, and then also for things like food and water, that's something we call a consumable. So those are essentially resources that you have a finite amount of. Uh, food, water, obviously one of those. Uh, they have about three days worth of food and plenty of water on board. Um, it wasn't the limiting consumable for this flight home, uh, as was discussed in our uh, pre-return uh, news conference, uh, carbon dioxide scrubbing was uh, kind of the low man on the totem pole uh, for the trip home. They have uh, just about three days worth. Um, so you have to think of all of these different items uh, that are life support systems typically that fall into that consumable port uh, whenever you're kind of mapping just how much on-orbit lifetime that you have. So uh, we knew that we were going to either return today or within 47 hours after that. And so we make sure we have plenty for that situation and then hours beyond that as just extra margin as we're always about redundancy and backup plans and everything like that. Something else to consider uh, with respect to the importance of inventory. Uh, during the re-entry period, we don't want anything loose flying around. Uh, that is point. certainly hazardous to the crew. And so taking inventory of what has been unstowed and then restowed allows us to be absolutely sure that something didn't accidentally, because you know, as you're floating there, it is easy to let go of something and then it might drift off to behind the control panel. Uh, like Dan said before, it's very easy for things to kind of drift off on the International Space Station and get lost. Uh, so really having this inventory allows us to make sure that there aren't any foreign objects uh, that aren't supposed to be out during the times in which they are meant to be stowed. So uh, inventory is important for a number of reasons. Our next question comes to us from Tim. He says, my 10-year-old daughter Haley wants to know how hot the exterior of the spacecraft will get during re-entry. Awesome. Well, Good morning, Haley, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for tuning into our webcast. We're really pleased to have young viewers joining us uh, for these, this historic mission. So a really good question. The outside of Dragon capsule will reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very hot, but Bob and Doug will be safe and comfortable inside of the Dragon capsule. Uh, we have measures in place to make sure that the inside of the capsule will be flushed with cold air, as well as the air inside of their spacesuits. So even though the outside will be getting really hot, Bob and Doug will barely be breaking a sweat. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from Mohan, who wants to know, will the Super Draco thrusters be a backup to the parachutes? That's a good question because one of the earliest designs of Dragon had it doing what's called a propulsive landing. So kind of like how the Falcon 9 comes back, uh, an early design of this Crew Dragon had it landing propulsively. So using those Super Dracos to touch down on like a runway. Um, that's no longer in Dragon's configuration. Uh, in fact, those uh, Super Draco thrusters are completely inhibited following a successful flight into orbit. They're only used 
for an emergency escape situation, either on the pad or during the initial climb up to orbit. They enable Dragon to do that escape uh, from the pad all the way up, so you have kind of that extra safety net your entire way uphill. But once they're on orbit and they're making their way to the space station or even when we're coming home, those thrusters are disabled. We're only using the smaller Draco thrusters around the service section, so the bottom of the capsule itself uh, and the four at the very top, the forward bulkhead thrusters. Um, our next question from Amy wants to know what happens to the parachutes after splashdown? Are they recovered? Yeah, absolutely. So there will be, after splashdown, there will be two fast boats or smaller boats that will be approaching the Dragon capsule. Uh, the first boat is responsible to for determining that there aren't any uh, toxic vapors surrounding the capsule. Uh, that, that boat, that the fast boat will then also be responsible for preparing the capsule for lift out of the water. The second boat is responsible for retrieving the parachutes out of the water. Uh, we definitely don't want to leave any waste behind where possible. Um, and so that second boat is responsible for going and retrieving the parachutes. After splashdown, those parachutes are automatically uh, cut so that there isn't, there's no potential that if there was a little bit of wind, that the Dragon capsule wouldn't be moved due to wind catching in those parachutes. So great question, but short answer is, yeah, they're cut. Uh, they're automatically cut after splashdown and then one of the crews from the fast boats is responsible for going to pick them up. The next question we have coming from hashtag AskNASA on Twitter comes to us from Novacon. What will be the purpose of the crew for the Crew-1 mission? The Crew-1 mission will be what we call the first operational flight of the Dragon spacecraft. So the mission we're still on right now is a demonstration. This is still a test mission. This is when we're really proving out Dragon's capabilities from launch all the way through splashdown. After this test, if everything goes well and we're lined up great for a splashdown today, we'll sit down and we'll go through a certification process for SpaceX to fly operational missions. This means they'll be flying regular expedition long duration flights. So the Crew-1 will be the first four person crew to launch in the Dragon spacecraft and then spend six months on board the International Space Station. So we'll have four individuals, uh, Mike Hopkins, uh, Victor Glover, Shanna Walker, and Soichi Noguchi from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency launching in Dragon and then spending six months on board the space station doing science experiments, uh, conducting spacewalks, repairs, everything that a normal expedition crew does. They'll just be arriving and leaving in a dragon. Yeah, I think Commander Chris Cassidy will still be on board with our targeted, given the, the current targeted Crew-1 launch. SpaceX Dragon, com check from the PLT. We've got you five by five, Bob. And I have two loud SpaceX and uh, check between us. And uh, please repeat the last uh, five seconds of that call. We had a bit of a calm dropout. Out of clear as well. We have been a good eye. And uh, Dragon, we copy that you heard us loud and clear. Unfortunately, the rest of the message was garbled. Please uh, repeat one more time. Yeah, we've got a good comm check between both of us, and we are complete with suit downing for decibel 010. How copy? Okay, that was five by five. Uh, we copy that you are complete with suit donning procedure. Okay, it sounds like the crew now suited up. They just conducted those communications checks, those comm checks with the core here in Hawthorne, uh, the core of the crew operations responsible engineer. That's essentially the, the person who's talking directly to Bob and Doug throughout their flight. Uh, that's rotated to, through a couple of different positions as we're on the third shift uh, of their flight home. Um, and that'll be pretty much the person who's getting all of the updates to and from uh, Bob and Doug, being that liaison between the teams on the ground. 
Uh, but they, they did those comm checks successfully. They are in their suits. They're going to stay in their suits and in their seats for the rest of the day, pretty much, from uh, that and deorbit Dragon burn. SpaceX looking for an update on uh, sections one through four of 4.700 four zero zero deorbit preparation when able. And SpaceX Dragon, we are complete with uh, sections one through four. And uh, looking at section five, uh, the only thing left there to do is uh, five alpha decimal two. Uh, as far as the uh, yeah, suit leak check, I think everything else is complete. Okay, copy uh, sections one through four are complete. And uh, it sounds like um, we have uh, Sounds like you're uh, completing fluid loading and standing by for the leak check. That's a good copy, Mike. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. So what we heard there was communication between Dragon and... And Mike, I just uh, wanted to check back with you on the comm dropout that you had on the, uh, the last two calls that I made to you. How is uh, this comm now? Was it uh, explainable as just random dropouts or is it uh, continuing from the PLTC? Okay, uh, Bob, we had you five by five just then, much better than before. We're investigating root cause, but given uh, the clarity of your call just now, I would suspect your audio system is healthy. Happy, thank you. Okay, so there we heard a little bit of communication, just confirming that we were uh, that Mission Control was able to read or hear, uh, as it's referred to, uh, Bob and Doug clearly as they have put on their suits. We also heard the go for uh, leak check. So now that the suits are on, we will be performing a quick leak check. We do this every time the suits are put on or donned, as you heard it called. Uh, basically, this is where we pressurize the suits. It's the only time that we pressurize them uh, throughout the mission. And it's essentially to make sure that, you know, all the zippers are in the right, are zipped up properly. All it takes is, you know, one small unzipped piece <laughs> to not hold the pressure. So we make sure that everything is uh, fitted up accordingly and that it's ready to go in case of the, in case of uh, a need to pressurize the suits uh, later in, in the, in the mission. Uh, unlikely, but it's nice to know, you know, just for that, um, for testing purposes to know that that capability is there. That's what they're designed for. So that leak check will commence. And um, after we get that, uh, we'll pressurize this, the, the, the suits themselves, and then they will depressurize. Bob and Doug will be able to lift the visor on their helmet again. Uh, and then that's essentially, you know, that's that's what, what they will be wearing uh, during this last phase of their mission as they reenter the Earth's atmosphere. So, uh, a lot of good stuff there. Again, nope, it's not, no call there. <laughs> Fake out. Uh, like we said before, we're taking your questions through Twitter this morning using the hashtag AskNASA. Our next question comes to us from Robert. Is the U.S. Navy supporting recovery with ships and aircraft? They are not. I suspect that that question comes from the last time we did splashdowns with U.S. spacecraft and astronauts where we had the Navy assisting throughout the Apollo program for the recoveries. Uh, they are not assisting in this. Uh, all of the uh, recovery assets for the nominal mission are SpaceX. So SpaceX owns both recovery ships, the Go Navigator and the Go Searcher, um, and then contract out with uh, the different helicopters and other assets that are used in this recovery. NASA does have a Department of Defense backup, essentially, uh, if Bob and Doug were to have to splash down anywhere other than those seven sites that we target around Florida, we have the capability to call them up to affect uh, a fast rescue and recovery uh, using para-jumpers or whatever assets are available to us. Uh, th they are also called up on launch days uh, in the event that we were to have an abort on the way to orbit with them coming down somewhere in the Atlantic. But uh, for now, today, everything is SpaceX and NASA. <laughs> 
Another question coming to us from Humzi. Is there a time limit on how long the capsule can be left to float in the Atlantic Ocean before it needs to be recovered? Yeah, so obviously we want to get the crew out as soon as possible, uh, let them get out and stretch their legs and begin their medical evaluations. Uh, however, the capsule would be able to float there for a couple of days, like we mentioned before. Uh, there is enough onboard water and food. Uh, they would be comfortable, uh, although if the waves pick up I certainly would not be comfortable. <laughs> that being said, uh, we do strive to recover them as soon as possible. Uh, this is part of the reason why we have uh, a numerous potential landing zone sites and we have special criteria for where they actually land to ensure that we're able to get the crew uh, up and out of the water and into the medical uh, bays essentially within an hour after splashdown. <laughs> All right, our next one comes from Mark, who wants to know, can they take over from the computer and do a manual splashdown if required? They can. Uh, initiating a deorbit or an emergency deorbit is one of the capabilities available to crew members on board. You would have to be in a pretty extreme situation to do that. Um, something we're obviously not in today is everything's gone really smoothly with Dragon, uh, but that is something that's available to them. Uh, they also have the capability to manually step in for a number of the different steps during the re-entry, uh, both mainly for uh, any parachute deployments uh, or even cutting the parachutes after they've splashed down. Uh, if that doesn't happen automatically, they have a button right in front of them on their displays where they can make that happen. So they do have quite a bit of capability to jump in if required. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the few hardwired uh, buttons on their display panel, but it is certainly not one that can be triggered accidentally. Yeah. It is a two-step verification yep. uh, lever, essentially. So uh, no need to worry about performing an emergency <laughs> deorbit emergency de accidentally. <laughs> uh, next question comes to us from NASA plus space equals heart. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Uh, will this Crew Dragon be reused? Yes, it will. Uh, this particular capsule is intended to be reused on the Crew 2 mission, which will be launching sometime next year. Uh, and yeah, we already have plans for reuse for it. In fact, the team at the Cape is already preparing to begin those uh, refurbishment processes as soon as the capsule lands, essentially really getting a head start on that. The capsule is waterproof. Uh, that was a process that we learned how to do through the crew cargo program, uh, our reuse efforts with that program. With our previous version of the Dragon capsule, also known as Dragon One, uh, the process of making that waterproof ha has that knowledge that we learned from that has transferred over to Crew Dragon capsules, and it's safe to say that uh, it is with uh, very little refurbishment required to the internal hardware. Uh, you know the is. There's very little refurbishment required because we're able to keep it watertight and eliminate any exposure to salt water, which for metallic surfaces does cause corrosion, which is no good for spaceflight. So uh, short answer is that, yeah, we will be reusing this uh, as soon as next year on the NASA Crew 2 mission. All right, our next one from Lisa. What are Bob and Doug bringing back from ISS, if anything? There's quite a bit, actually. Uh, they have about 150 kilograms or a little over 330 pounds of cargo uh, essentially strapped to the ground right underneath their seats. Uh, the lion's share of that is utilization or science samples, uh, a lot of it cold stowage samples that's kept in powered freezers. Uh, those samples coming from a range of biological, biomedical studies, uh, a lot of them with the astronauts themselves as the, te as the test subjects. Uh, as cargo return, a pretty critical capability as we do, we execute a lot of the science on station, but we need to return a lot of the samples for analysis down in labs here on Earth, and they're going to be bringing a lot of that down. Uh, they're also returning some vehicle hardware items uh, that have either malfunctioned or just passed their service life and need to come home or get inspected. Um, and then a couple of their personal items, things like their sleeping bags are coming back with them. Uh, and they also have a couple of special items we've touched on a few times, including that Tremor dinosaur uh, that was chosen by both of their sons as their zero G indicator for this mission. Uh, and the flag that was left there by Doug Hurley and his fellow crewmates of STS-135, the final 
space shuttle mission that is coming home. It's been up there for just about nine years, and it will fly again when we send humans around the moon in the not too distant future. And I know we haven't seen it, but I have heard that Little Earth is also coming back. I almost forgot about <laughs> that. Uh, he, Little Earth was the zero G indicator on Demo 1 and remained on station after that mission, and it's pretty sure it was packed away to come home on Demo 2. I think you're right. <laughs> so right now, Dragon is currently flying over the far South Pacific Ocean. Uh, we have a nice little map here to show you of our ground tracking. So there you can see it on your screen. Uh, if you're curious, the yellow indicates where the capsule is in daylight. The red part of the line indicates where it goes into eclipse or uh, whenever it's basically hiding in Earth's shadow. So right now it's in daylight. Bob and Doug must be getting some pretty spectacular views as they're completing their suit up process. Uh, but at this point, we're going to take a quick break and leave you with our lovely ground map here. Dragon SpaceX for video. Go ahead. Yeah, request to come back aboard when y'all are ready. We are ready for you to come aboard. Outstanding and work.
Dragon SpaceX, you are go for procedure 4.011 suit leak check. Suit leak check and work. Okay, so we just heard the crew now stepping into suit leak checks. As we've described a few times, this is when they're actually going to pressurize uh, their suits that they wear for launch and entry, and really any of the dynamic phases of the mission. Uh, so they'll completely zip up and seal the suits and then flow nitrox in they to confirm. Dragon in two, decimal two, we are ready to pressurize. Dragon SpaceX, you are go to pressurize. So Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley getting the go. They're going to pressurize their suits. So pressurized nitrox now going to flow in. Again, these suits are, we have confirmation the leak check is in progress. So these suits are worn as just another line of defense to help protect the crew members um, from the, really the harsh environment of outer space. Uh, if they were to experience a cabin depressurization, uh, any kind of poisonous leak in their atmosphere, um, or even a fire, these suits are designed to protect from all of those different instances. Um, so the suit leak check is pretty standard. Anytime before we get into one of these dynamic operations, we just want one more check to make sure that the suit is ready to go in case it's called upon. Um, and so they'll pressurize now and flow some nitrox, some uh, nitrogen and oxygen uh, through their suits. They'll look for it to maintain a constant pressure uh, and then once that's done, they'll depressurize the suits and they'll leave the zipper open. To, uh, oh. They'll typically leave uh, one zipper just unzipped a little bit uh, when they're not pressurized. Uh, they'll still have cool air flowing through. In fact, they'll do what's called a suit purge uh, just before we do the deorbit burn. So at the same time, they uh, flush the cabin atmosphere itself with uh, some cool down air. They'll flow some cooled air through the suits just to help uh, regulate the temperature, the cooling effect inside the capsule, uh, just to make sure the environment stays at a comfortable temperature for them while the Dragon capsule itself heats up to about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So we got about a minute left in this suit leak check. We'll wait for the results on that and we'll just be one more box checked on our way to the upcoming uh, trunk set, deorbit burn, re-entry, and splashdown. And one interesting thing to note, if you're watching this ground track, you're gonna start to see uh, that line coming out of the bottom left corner and ending in the gulf, that's, that means we are on our final orbit. And so Dragon's basically on its last lap around planet Earth, the last 90 minutes it's going to spend uh, until we just about get to that splashdown. So you can keep an eye on that. The line's gonna stop moving uh, where you can see it terminate in the gulf. Dragon SpaceX, we show nominal leak check. Show the same.
So there a minute ago we had confirmation of nominal leak check. Again, that's just ch checking another box off on the to-do list as uh, Bob and Doug continue their return home back to planet Earth. Uh, up next, we will be making sure that the nitrox system is safe uh, and that we are able to proceed into uh, the next phases of our of our uh, descent to the uh, the Gulf of Mexico. We are aiming for a splashdown site just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Right now, our recovery ship is en route. Uh, to that designated location zone, and it will be there ready and waiting for Bob and Doug to splash down. There are your screen. We do have a live shot from Go Navigator. Again, that's our recovery ship located in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you can get a little bit of a feel for that wave action that we got there. Generally speaking, pretty calm looking based on the waves that we can see there in the shot. Uh, and yeah, so we're excited to be able to welcome Bob and Doug back home. Uh, just checking my timeline quickly. Their landing will be coming up in just under two hours. We're looking at uh, an hour and 57 minutes. Uh, that will be happening at 11.48 a.m. Pacific time, 18.48 Universal Coordinated time. Before we get to their water landing, uh, we have to perform a couple of steps prior to that. If you've been following along with us this morning, you're probably very familiar with this. Uh, but for perhaps those of those of you who have joined in within the last few minutes, uh, at this point, we are exactly an hour away from the next physical milestone that needs to be completed prior to uh, Dragon Endeavor's return to planet Earth. Those activities will begin with claw separation. The claw is what connects the umbilicals, uh, the power, the telemetry, the fluids uh, between the dragon capsule and its trunk. In order to expose the heat shield in preparation for dragon's re-entry through the atmosphere, we need to jettison the trunk. It will disintegrate upon entering the Earth's atmosphere itself. So once we separate that, uh, we're now able to step into what's called slew to deorbit burn attitude. That's essentially maneuvering the capsule into position uh, to perform the deorbit burn. The deorbit burn is where we fire the four Draco thrusters that are located at the top of the capsule uh, near the forward hatch. We call those the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters. Those will be utilized to perform the deorbit burn. Uh, it'll last about 11 and a half minutes. That deorbit burn is what will be placing Dragon in its final trajectory to the exact landing location. So like I said, that'll be about 11 and a half minutes long. After that burn completes, we want to close the nose cone and lock it up. Uh, like I said, that's where the forward hatch is located. And since these capsules are designed to be reusable, we definitely want to protect those thrusters and that hatch because that is the hatch where the astronauts uh, basically exit and enter the capsule when they're going in and out of the International Space Station. So once we have that nose cone uh, locked and in place, we then enter, uh, we begin to enter the Earth's atmosphere. Try and again, SpaceX uh, for deorbit burn brief. Go ahead. Okay, first stuff for uh, timing, I'm showing no changes. Your tablet and onboard times on your timeline are within about one minute or less of our ground estimates. How copy? Copy. Uh, timing on board is uh, per the iPads and uh, within a minute. And even better, the uh, onboard uh, countdown in your timeline should be within a few should be within a few seconds. So looking pretty good um, for the vehicle. Endeavor is looking great for entry. Uh, the ready comm during bombs comm check earlier uh, we consider temporary, and we are not tracking any system issues. How copy? Endeavor's in good shape and good comm from the PLT. Okay, uh, as far as recovery goes, Go Navigator is uh, 
just about uh, at the recover in position, so within a few kilometers. In addition, the uh, WB is airborne. Her recovery team is a uh, go at this time. Go for recovery. Copy off. Yep, and one quick go back. Recovery has arrived, so they are on station. Um, in addition for the weather, uh, I'm looking at the weather right now from Go or the water video from uh, Go Navigator, and it looks like glass. It's awesome. Uh, the latest splashdown forecast, though, is uh, winds at two decimal two five knots, wave height less than a foot, and a six second period. How copy? Copy winds, waves, and weather. All right, so there we heard the deorbit briefing. This is basically the opportunity that the core here. Okay, Doug, that's all we got for the burn brief. We'll talk to you shortly before deorbit sequence start. Copy all, thanks, Mike. And uh, correction there, we'll have uh, the go no go for you shortly. That'll be the next step. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, the, the burn briefing there, just making sure that everyone's on the same page. Since Bob and Doug's primary primary role during re-entry is to monitor telemetry, timing, uh, and data, it is important to make sure that their onboard timers, or, or basically time listings, are synced with the most recent trajectory simulations that we've generated here uh, in, in mission control. So that's what that was, just making sure that their, their t sequence of events was lining up with the uh, with what we're seeing down here uh, in in mission control so uh all really good stuff there. We also heard that the recovery vessel Go Navigator is in position, uh, so it is ready and waiting for splashdown, which, like I said before, uh, will be occurring at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 Universal, and we're just under two hours from that happening. So uh, I don't know about you, Dan, but as we're stepping into these checks and these, and uh, you know, we did the leak check, we did have, to, have done a couple of comm checks, and now we're talking about deorbit burn. My heart's starting to go. We're it's, getting there. It's starting to feel real. We're, we're, we're waking back up. Yeah. It's, it's time to bring these guys home. And I mean, hearing, hearing the core call up, the water looks like glass from those ship views. That's exactly the, the type of thing we want to hear. Uh, the wind has picked up a tiny bit to 2.25 knots. It's about 2.6, a little under 2.6 miles per hour. So still well within our margins for what we were looking for, for accept, acceptable splash sound weather. Um, right now in the room behind us and over in Mission Control Houston, teams are just doing a final go, no go. And so that should wrap up over the next couple of minutes. And then we'll hear them call that up to the crew members when they get the final go to do the deorbit burn. Um, but we'll be doing all of the other activities prior to that, uh, including the claw and trunk separation, and then just getting ourselves ready for the orbit burn. So things are definitely gonna start picking up uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, really the next hour is real is really where things start to happen. Um, but we're, we do have a couple of uh, moments now to get joined by a special guest. Dragon, SpaceX is go for the deorbit burn and the burn has been enabled. That's a great call to hear. Denver Cafe, go for the deorbit burn and we see it on board. All right, so we just heard it. That means uh, both the SpaceX and NASA teams are go for deorbit burn. So we are uh, counting down to that, that deorbit burn. Uh, still a bit of a ways off. It's just under an hour from now from starting for that 11 and a half minute burn. But for now, as we are go for deorbit and return of Bob and Doug, we're going to send it over to the uh, the Johnson Space Center real quick, where Courtney Beasley is standing by in Mission Control Houston, along with uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, also there in Houston. But Courtney. Thanks, Dan. Yes, joining me in a studio here at NASA's Johnson Space Center is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Another historic day for our agency, returning humans to Earth in a commercially built and operated spacecraft. How is this mission paving the way for the future? Well, it's a great question, and I, I think um, it's really 
establishing the business model for the future. So you can see today I'm wearing my Artemis shirt. Uh, and when we go to the moon, we're going to go with commercial partners. Um, and, and, you know, NASA's goal here, we don't want to purchase, own, and operate the hardware the way we used to. We want to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. But we also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation and safety uh, and really create this virtuous cycle of, of economic development and capability. And that's, um, that's what today's return is going to represent. This is the next era in human spaceflight where NASA gets to be the customer. Uh, we want to be a strong customer. We want to be a great partner. Uh, but we don't want to be the only ones that are operating with humans in space. And while on board, Bob and Doug were, of course, conducting science experiments and spacewalks. And how are NASA's efforts on this station contributing to life back here on Earth? So when we think about the International Space Station, um, it really is focused on how do we do those transformational activities that benefit human life here on Earth. And uh, certainly, um, you know, when we think about advanced, uh, advanced materials, industrialized biomedicine, these are the things that we're developing every day. Some examples would include, as far as advanced materials, very, very thin materials like an artificial retina for the human eyeball. So somebody who has macular degeneration might not have to lose their eyesight in the future. Um, we can only create materials that thin in the microgravity of space. We cannot do it here in the gravity well of Earth. But that's just one of so many examples when we think about how we compound pharmaceuticals, when we think about how we um, you know, create immunizations for things like salmonella um, and, and other diseases. Um, th these are capabilities that are available to us because of the resource that is microgravity. Um, but, it, you know, advanced materials, things like very pristine fiber optic cables, we call it ZBLAN, for example. These are all things that we think that there is a marketplace for the future. So, look, right now we're doing commercial resupply of the International Space Station. As of today, uh, when Bob and Doug come home safely, we will be doing commercial crew to the International Space Station. The next big thing is we need commercial space stations themselves. And in order to create the market for commercial space stations, we have to have these transformational capabilities that come from the microgravity environment. And that's really what we're developing right now. As you know, a big day for NASA today, but how about a big week? This week alone, we launched Mars 2020. Artemis One's launch vehicle stage adapter was delivered to Kennedy Space Center. And here we are completing the first commercial, commercially crewed mission to the International Space Station. What are your thoughts on the state of the agency at this point? So make no mistake, uh, NASA's budget right now is the highest it's ever been in nominal dollars. Um, and, and it's at you know, $22 billion. The budget request that President Trump gave us that is before the House and the Senate right now is $25.2 billion. It's not just about sustaining you know, capabilities like commercial crew, commercial resupply, the International Space Station. It's also about developing new capabilities so that the United States of America can stay the preeminent spacefaring nation. It's why we created the Artemis program to go to the moon sustainably with commercial partners and international partners to use the resources of, of the moon to live and work for long periods of time and then take all of that knowledge onto Mars. And of course, as you mentioned on Thursday, you know, we launched uh, the, you know, another Mars mission. The most sophisticated robot that NASA has ever developed is right now on its way to Mars. And we're going to prove that we can turn the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars into pure oxygen for life support. But there's so many other things. We're looking for life on another world. We're looking for signs of ancient life um, on Mars. Um, we're talking about microbial life, but life nonetheless. And um, this, is, this is really a, a bright moment for NASA. I want to be clear, though. Um, we need support from our members of Congress in both the House and the Senate. Uh, we, we need to be able to get that $25.2 billion budget that we have requested. Um, and so I'm working with members of Congress and senators on both sides of the aisle every day, uh, doing town halls across the country. We are in great shape. Uh, but in order to stay number one in the world, uh, we're going to need we're going to need the resources that, that that the president has requested. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Such an exciting day. And in case you missed it just moments ago, both SpaceX and NASA are both a go for deorbit burn. So with that, we'll send it back to Dan and Kate at Hawthorne for the latest.
All right. Thank you so much, Courtney. Great to hear from the administrator. And we're we're in it now. We're we're kind of in the final stretch. This is what I feel like we've been waiting for for the last <laughs> couple of hours, and it feels pretty great to be here. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, in this next phase of the mission, Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning Bob and Doug home. Uh, as you've heard us talk a little bit so far this morning, uh, Dragon will maneuver to the correct attitude and jettison its trunk, uh, which is the cylindrical, unpressurized part of the um, of the assembly. Uh, we need to expose the heat shield in order to prepare the capsule for uh, atmospheric reentry. So uh, we. We will, oh, there we got a nice view of Bob and Doug in their suits. This is the first time we've seen them in their suits and in their chairs this morning. So there they are tapping away, preparing uh, to initiate the uh, deorbit sequence. So yeah, let's talk I mean, a little, I'm sorry, I was, go ahead. I was gonna say just like in the lead up in the last couple of minutes, we heard they had good suit leak checks. As Kate described earlier, once the leak checks are complete, they don't keep the suit pressurized, so visors mm -hmm. are open. Uh, they're going to have cool air running through their suits and the cabin and just getting ready for the ride. Yeah. Uh, whenever they are re-entering the atmosphere, the external temperature will reach about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The internal temperature of the cabin, however, will stay around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we have a couple of systems in place to keep it cool and comfortable for Bob and Doug as they are returning. Uh, like Dan just said, there will be some cool air flowing through their suits. The cabin itself will also be purged with cold, cooler air as well. Uh, so that will assist in making sure that the temperature stays pretty temperate uh, inside the capsule. And I mean, we're, we're just 42 minutes and 50 seconds away from things really kicking up. And this is going to be when we really start to do uh, that first maneuver to get ready to jettison the trunk. And then we'll do that claw and trunk separation. And then it's time for just kind of that final firing of those engines that really just that downhill ride. Yeah, those uh, forward bulkhead thrusters, uh, there are four of them, four of those Draco thrusters there at the top of the capsule near the nose cone. Those will be utilized to perform the deorbit burn. This burn is what will essentially give Dragon its final trajectory back home. Uh, this is the last burn that the capsule will perform. If you've been following along since yesterday afternoon, you know that there have been a number of burns completed. This deorbit burn will be the final one. It will last about 11 and a half minutes. After that burn completes, uh, we no longer need to utilize those Draco thrusters and we want to protect the forward hatch up there so we close the nose cone and lock it up. Uh, we're expecting that event to happen at 11 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, about uh, uh, 10 minutes, or excuse me, uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, wow, mental <laughs> math on air is hard. <laughs> uh, 25 minutes after that the capsule will be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, and like I mentioned, approaching about 3,500 degrees, and that's because... We're, we're in that heat of re-entry, and so that's where things will really heat up for Bob and Doug on their re-entry, uh, and that's where we'll have that comms blackout. Um, and we actually have a Twitter question that's germane to this right now, where Stephen asked, during the blackout, will you not be able to communicate with Bob and Doug, but you will be able to track them? And it's, it's kind of a mix. Uh, we won't be able to talk to Bob and Doug. We won't be able to send or receive any data from the Dragon spacecraft. So we won't have basically telemetry driven tracking, but we know exactly where they're going to be as their orbit's already been calculated. We've had this orbit calculated since yesterday, essentially. It's gotten fine-tuned as we've done those burns, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll know exactly where they're supposed to be even though we can't communicate during that time. Exactly, and even though we won't be able to send or receive signals uh, or commands or telemetry, Dragon is designed to be fully autonomous. Uh, at that point, it is driving itself anyway, so there's really nothing to be worried about Bob and Doug's primary function at that point is to monitor all of the telemetry that they see on their screens and to stay comfy. Yeah, and uh, once they're through that, uh, that really that initial entry, um, we'll have that part called entry interface, which we uh, kind of explained as that's when the capsule's really experiencing aerodynamics. They've been flying around in the vacuum of space with no air, so no lift, drag, stuff like that on their capsule and entry interfaces where they're really starting to hit the, the atmosphere and it's affecting the capsule. And it'll continue to use its Draco thrusters on the service section to really guide it back home. Yeah, exactly. 
So speaking of guiding it back home, <laughs> here come the parachutes. At 11.44 a.m. Pacific or 18.44 Universal Time, we are, we're going to be deploying the drogue parachutes. Drogue chutes are utilized for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, to continue to further decelerate the vehicle uh, and also to stabilize it. Like Dan said, it will be experiencing some of those aerodynamic pressures. And so we want to make sure that the, the capsule is well and stable. And, before we deploy the main parachutes. Those main chutes will be deploying at 11.45 a.m. and there will be four of them. Those will essentially deploy and it takes a couple seconds for them to fully inflate. So it might look a little funny at first, uh, but we assure you that they are working properly and it just takes a couple seconds for the air to continue to catch in them and for them to fully expand uh, to their large rounder shape. So after those chutes deploy, it only takes three and a half minutes for a bobbin duck to splash down. Uh, that'll be occurring at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 Universal. And like we've mentioned before, our splashdown location is off the coast, off the western coast of Florida. We're aiming for a location near Pensacola. Uh, our recovery vessel Go Navigator is currently in location, ready and waiting for splashdown. They're actually going to be waiting about three nautical miles away from that splashdown point. Yeah, we got the call that they were on station. We also got the call that the NASA WV-57 airplane is in the air, and we've actually seen a couple of brief spurts of video. That's the airborne asset that we'll have, that WB-57 is a high-altitude research plane uh, that NASA flies. It's outfitted with a number of imaging cameras. Uh, the main one that we'll be seeing is an infrared one. Um, if you watched the demo one splashdown, which I'm sure you all did, uh, you were able to see uh, that first, and this is actually a glimpse of that WB-57 camera. Um, we'll be getting this back, and uh, if we acquire it the same time we did for Demo 1, uh, we were able to see the capsule while it was still in that atmospheric reentry. so it was just this really bright light that all of a sudden lit up the sky, and that was the first view we got of Dragon. And so we'll use that to hopefully see uh, during the entry and then the initial parachute deploys, and then we'll have a couple more assets on the ground or on the water on the boat uh, that will get a couple more views of Dragon as it delivers Bob and Doug safely to the ocean. Yeah, so as you can hear, the, all of this excitement will be happening in pretty rapid succession. Uh, on your screen now, we can see closest to the, to the camera, we have NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. Uh, he is the, the pilot or the commander for this particular mission, and then two there now on the camera to the right is astro NASA astronaut Bob Benkin. Uh, we are very fondly looking forward to uh, bringing our space dads home this morning, uh, and it looks like, uh, like we mentioned before, that'll be happening in about an hour and a half. Again, targeting splashdown for 11:48 a.m. Pacific, 18:48 Universal Time. But like we mentioned before, the action really begins at the claw separation milestone. Stone, which is slated for 10.51 a.m. Pacific in about 38 minutes from now. So, uh, again, we are continuing to take questions this morning through Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. Our next question comes to us from F1 Fanatic. Do the astronauts need to have face masks down during reentry? That is a great question. Very astute observation that those visors are in the upward position. So right now, the suits are unpressurized and Bob and Doug are breathing just the, the normal cabin air. Those face masks, the, our visors as we refer to them, uh, do need to be lowered and uh, locked during the reentry period. We need the, the spacesuit to be fully enclosed during the more dynamic elements of operations and certainly the re-entry period is one of them. So we'll actually at one point during the deorbit burn preparation uh, phase, we will actually hear communication between uh, ground station, from ground here, mission control headquarters at SpaceX to Bob and Doug, just to confirm and double check that those visors are, uh, are in place where they should be. Our next question comes to us from Philip. Where exactly are the parachutes stored before deployment? They are stored on uh, in two separate compartments on the Dragon spacecraft um, on a side of the vehicle that has a deployable panel. 
Um, the drogue parachutes are stored in the kind of the upper part, it's called the upper bulkhead, um, and they're deployed by two drogue motors um, or mortars. Uh, so pyrotechnics that are fired to actually deploy those drogue parachutes. Um, just further down the panel, kind of at the base of the spacecraft, is where the four main parachutes are stored. And again, those get drawn out by the drogue chutes. Um, there are redundant systems in place to make sure uh, that if uh, the first set of mortars don't fire, you have backups to get these chutes deployed. Um, we're uh, one fault tolerant on both the, uh, the drogue parachutes and the main parachutes. Um, so one out of two drogues and three out of four mains uh, is what the vehicle's been rated and tested to. Uh, we've, uh, SpaceX has done uh, a tremendous amount of testing on these parachutes, uh, even within just uh, the last several months in the lead up to the mission. Uh, as parachutes, obviously a very critical part of the reentry. Um, and this is something that is very meticulously packed and documented before the start of any mission. Uh, and NASA assisting SpaceX as we have some experts who have been involved in parachute missions uh, for decades. Um, but uh, the parachutes are stored under deployable panels and we'll see them uh, basically fire open as the, as the parachutes come out and deploy at the different altitudes. Yeah, those panels are basically located above and below the side hatch uh, panel. So if you are looking at the Dragon capsule, uh, the, you know, the anchor point for those parachutes will ensure that the side hatch will effectively be uh, as far away from the ocean uh, surface as possible, ensuring that we're able to expedite the process of um, egressing Bob and Doug from the capsule and the whole recovery process as a whole. Great question. All right, our next one comes from Scott. He wants to know what are the tablets on their legs used for? What kind of devices are they? I think you've heard him call out a few times that they're using iPads uh, on board and they're really just uh, essentially their user manuals. Uh, they're able to dial up different procedures, uh, checklists, things that they're looking for throughout uh, their flight. They get, they're they able to Velcro them essentially to their suits. Um, and just like uh, the uh, the main displays in front of them, they're touchscreen enabled, and they have the touchscreen capable gloves in their suits. Uh, it's really just another information source. Um, Dragon doesn't have the big paper manuals that we were used to in the shuttle era and things like that, uh, just kind of streamlining everything as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Like we mentioned before, this is a demonstration mission. And so Bob and Doug's job here is to make sure that everything is working as it should be. So a lot of what they're doing is going to simply be monitoring. Well, not simply. <laughs> Paying attention can be, uh, especially whenever you, there's a lot going on dynamically around you, is staying focused can be tough. So it's yeah. not an easy job what they have coming up. But they will essentially be responsible for monitoring all the data and telemetry that is being received on screens. And part of the debriefing that will happen once they get back on land is quite simply, was there anything that happened in reality that you weren't expecting or differed from what you were instructed would occur? So making sure that in the future fully uh, operational uh, missions that we have, starting with Crew-1, launching later this year, uh, that those crews are fully prepared and that we make those, essentially those instruction manuals that they do have access to as perfect as possible uh, because it is essential that we, we have correct information and that the crew is informed and aware of all the operations that are going on regardless of whether or not they may not, they're not the ones necessarily commanding because the vehicle is autonomous, uh, but it is important that they, they, do, they do know what's going on. All right, our next question comes from Sam. Might be the most important one of the day. Wanted to know if Bob and Doug can listen to the SpaceX <laughs> webcast when they're inside the Dragon capsule. I mean, I certainly hope so. It's not like they have too much else on their mind. Right. <laughs> um, no, they're not able to listen to us, but one kind of fun fact that always kind of makes us geek out a little bit is the crew members on board the space station will usually get uh, NASA TV pumped up to them anytime their crewmates are launching or landing. So they're able to watch uh, uh, their friends and former crewmates as of just a few hours ago return home. So, uh, Chris, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> Great question. Another one comes to us from Ruhr Rocker. 
Does the Dragon capsule have windows where Bob and Doug can look out? Absolutely. Uh, actually, one of my favorite pictures that Doug Hurley has posted on Instagram to date was actually one of the first pictures he posted at the beginning of this mission was a shot of what he could see outside of Crew Dragon's windows. Uh, there is a window located on either side of the side hatch, and uh, it, it certainly will provide um, visual uh, confirmation that re-entry is happening like Dan mentioned before. They'll be able to see uh, a little bit of the energy that's being um, that's being expelled during the re-entry period. Uh, you know, some of those pieces of the ablative material as they heat up and are designed to flicker away, uh, they'll actually be able to see that from, from the windows themselves. So it'll be quite the fireworks show. <laughs> All right, our next one comes from Joe. Wants to know, does the Dragon Capsule have Netflix? <laughs> Another important question. Yeah, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, as our as our views here of the capsule cycle through, uh, we'll be able to see what their screens look like. There we go. So there in the center screen, we actually have the ground tracking map. As you can see there, actually it might be kind of hard to make out, but uh, Dragon is actually uh, in uh, crossing over the Atlantic Ocean, now approaching what looks like uh, England and Ireland. So it will be crossing over into Europe soon. Um, and also on those screens on to the left and the right of that uh, ground track screen were their telemetry screens. So uh, those will be the, the interface that they use during the, uh, during the deorbit burn. Uh, and that's what they'll essentially use to make sure that everything is looking good and performing nominally. Yeah, and I mean, the, that center screen that you just saw, that's essentially the same map that we've been looking mm -hmm. at uh, throughout our coverage here today. So uh, they're looking at a lot of the same data that we're trying to give you guys down here on the ground, just where are they over the Earth? Because uh, it can be a little disorienting uh, to look out the window and figure it out quickly. Uh, but they're able to see just how far along their orbit they are, where those milestones are coming up. Um, so they can just, again, they're, they're in a monitor mode and they're ready uh, locked and loaded to jump in if required. Um, our next question comes from Roshan, who a uh, seven-year-old Ian wants to know, why is the Dragon capsule cone-shaped? Uh, for a very specific reason, and that's why a lot of cat or a lot of spacecraft are in a capsule shape. Um, when they were trying to really figure out the most efficient way to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, um, uh, both from uh, handling the trajectory um, without having uh, wings like a space shuttle, um, you uh, starting over. When they were really first trying to figure out how to uh, best shape a spacecraft to efficiently and effectively re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in the safest configuration, where they essentially landed on was a cone shape. Um, or, or a capsule shape. They, they, there were uh, very initial drawings that you could find all manner of spacecraft that were put into wind tunnels, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, all the way back in the early days of space flight when we were in the, in the Mercury um, and uh, the, the very early days, uh, they were able to determine that the capsule shape was really the most efficient. That shape of heat shield dissipated the heat the best, uh, was the easiest to control, and was really the safest option. And physics haven't changed since the 60s, at least not a great deal. Um, so that's why you still see a lot of capsule-shaped uh, spacecraft, and it's really just for re-entering an atmosphere. Good question. So there on your screen, again, we have live shots coming from Dragon Endeavor as it is making its way back towards Earth. We are in approaching the final steps of the day of, of the mission, in fact. Uh, and at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.18 uh, a.m. or p.m., excuse me, <laughs> uh, Universal, we will, we will have the, the splashdown of Dragon Endeavor. So right now, Bob and Doug are essentially cycling through, preparing for uh, what we call deorbit burn initiation. Uh, this will be where uh, there's a, the deorbit burn is, is what will be placing Dragon on its specific on its final trajectory to a specific landing location. Uh, that location has was 
there were seven possible ones. We determined the best one for today's reentry uh, to be off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. The recovery vessel Go Navigator is in place, ready and waiting. Uh, and seems like Bob and Doug are pretty comfortable there. They are in their spacesuits. The leak check has been performed and we got the call out that it was nominal. So everything good there. Right now those visors are in the up position. Uh, they will be closed and locked whenever we get into the dynamic portion here upcoming in just a few minutes. Checking my timeline here. We're just about 24 minutes and 20 seconds from things really pick it up. That's when we'll start to get into the attitude to separate the trunk. And just about eight minutes after that is when we'll start the deorbit burn. Uh, and again, that'll be the longest burn of Dragon's Return journey. Uh, the latest timeline we got had it lasting for about 11 minutes and 22 seconds. It'll be the last firing of those forward bulkhead thrusters. Um, the four Dracos at the very top of Dragon that'll eventually be covered up by the nose cone following the deorbit burn. And as we've said before, that deorbit burn is what commits them to coming home. When that happens, that capsule is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And that'll put them essentially on a collision course with planet Earth. It, it lines up their, their orbit uh, to intersect with that splashdown point in the Gulf of Mexico. And while we have just a few more minutes until we get to that, we still have some questions coming in. Again, if you have one, jump over on Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, this one comes from Scarif Survivor, who wants to know, does Dragon lose radio data contact with satellite or ground stations during reentry? And the answer is really everything. Uh, as that plasma uh, builds up around the spacecraft, it essentially prevent signals uh, being sent or transmitted or received by Dragon's antennas around the outside of the spacecraft. So uh, it's both satellites and ground stations um, that it won't be able to communicate with. But again, Dragon continues flying itself. Uh, we know what its orbit is plotted out to be, so we know where it is. And we even know the expected time of that calm blackout in about six minutes. So. Uh, it does lose contact with everything. We won't be able to hear from Bob and Doug until they're on the other side uh, of that blackout and then we'll reestablish communication with Dreg. All right, we have another one from Nettie Banda. Wanted to know how many seats are in Dragon. So as you can see on your screen there, there are actually, uh, I guess one is hidden, there are actually four chairs there available. We will be utilizing all four seats on the Crew-1 mission uh, launching later this year, currently targeted for September. Uh, right now, Bob and Doug are only occupying two of them as this is a demonstration mission. So uh, yeah, we will be utilizing all four of those seats in future missions, but as of right now, uh, I believe it was on the uh, launch portion of the mission. One of those seats was occupied by Tremor, who, if you've been following along, is the sequined dinosaur uh, that was voted on by uh, the two sons from Bob and Doug as what should be the zero G indicator. So Tremor was strapped into a seat during ascent and when they got the okay to release him, he started floating into the capsule and uh, uh, you know, gave us its sequined glory there in <laughs> on the edge of space. <laughs> All right. Well, again, just another time hack as we're coming up on these. We're just a little over 20 minutes from the start of all of our deorbit burn sequencing starting. 
Um, so we're looking at that to, to really pick up at about uh, 1048 as we'll start getting into the attitude for trunk separation. And then we start basically executing a bunch of steps that are going to commit Bob and Doug to this re-entry. Yeah, we're looking forward to those. Uh, it will be it'll be quite the journey. Now, of course, uh, with respect to the deorbit burn, Bob and Doug will remain in their seats and strapped in for the entire duration. In fact, they won't be exiting those seats until they are being, uh, until they're able to egress or exit the capsule after it has splashed down and been recovered out of the ocean and uh, safely resting in the nest of the recovery vessel. Along that note, our next Twitter question is from Brett. The question is, what is the orientation of the astronauts when seated? As in, do they face the front or the top of the capsule, and do they find it comfortable? Great question there. So in the views that we just had a couple minutes ago, they were, uh, re I guess what we would call in the reclined position, they were facing towards the top of the capsule. Uh, during the launch portion, whenever they were actually getting into the capsule, back in late May, the seats were actuated in the down position uh, where they were facing towards the hatch. Uh, the angle of difference is about 40 degrees between the two positions. They actuate in order to make sure that whenever there are uh, whenever there are G's being experienced that it is in the most comfortable and uh, safely ergonomic way possible. So that's where seat or uh, actuation comes in handy. Also, it also helps them to get in and out out of the capsule, it's a little trickier whenever the seats are in the up position or when they're when they're reclined facing upward toward the top of the capsule. As for comfort level, I've heard that they have found it pretty comfortable. Uh, the seats are actually custom fitted for each astronaut uh, destined to be flying in it. So whenever a crew member is assigned to a mission, they will also be assigned a seat specifically. So there will be no uh, mid-flight fire drills where everyone is. <laughs> switching seats. Uh, everyone has a designated seat. They're essentially small, medium, and large. Uh, and the armrests are also customizable depending on how long the crew member's forearm is. So um, we have taken many steps uh, with comfort in mind, as well as style. You've seen those spacesuits. They look pretty good, in my opinion. Um, but those spacesuits are also similarly custom fitted for each individual crew member. So with the combination of the custom fit of the suit, as well as the custom fit of the seats. Uh, we have aimed to make it as comfortable as possible uh, in the event of, you know, some sort of situation where we need to wave off an activity, uh, you know, for up to 48 hours. That's a long time to be in a confined space, even if you are highly trained like these guys. Uh, so yeah, making sure that they are as comfortable as possible while inside the cabin was certainly high priority. All right. Our next question comes from Richard. Uh, this one deals with kind of hygiene on the space station. Just curious how the astronauts that have been on station a while, how do they stay so clean cut? I know there's not a barber on board. Do they cut their own hair? It just looks clean cut. Do they shower, do laundry? How do they do it? They do have to cut their own hair. Um, and uh, even the current commander, Chris Cassidy, who's still on board, famously shaved his head once as his fellow <laughs> crewmate, Luca Parmitano, was about to arrive on space station just so he had uh, some, some bald company. Um, <laughs> But they do have trimmers on board the International Space Station that have a vacuum attached to them, so they're not just uh, getting hair just uh, all throughout the cabin as, like everything else, hair would just tend to float around and get caught in the drafts of the air circulation on board. So they use uh, basically vacuum cutters uh, in order to give themselves haircuts. So that's how they're able to do it. No professional stylist up there, um, but they're able to, to make do and yeah. stay a little less shaggy. Quick time check here as we just passed 1030. Uh, it's now 1032 here in California. Uh, we are less than 20 minutes away from our first event uh, here on our list as Bob and Doug begin to check off, continue to check off the boxes of their return home. That first event is claw separation. That's essentially the initiation of trunk jettison. Uh, all of that means that we will need to unlatch 
the claw from the trunk. Uh, that is the mechanism that holds and connects the trunk to the capsule, delivers fluid, uh, telemetry, power, all that good stuff. We need to uh, expose the trunk in order for the capsule to deorbit. So we will jettison the trunk uh, and then we will begin a deorbit burn a couple minutes later. That deorbit burn is slated to begin at 10.56 a.m. Pacific. 1856 universal coordinated time. So in just 20, just under 23 minutes, we're expecting that to start. Once again, if you're just joining us, we've got some live views inside the Dragon Endeavor capsule. Bob and Doug, they're in their seats as they are making final preparations and doing final reviews as we get ready to initiate the deorbit sequence. Closest to the camera there is NASA astronaut Doug Hurley, and further away from the camera is NASA astronaut Bob Benkin. These are two incredibly, incredi incredibly wonderful humans. Uh, we affectionately call them our space dads here at SpaceX. Uh, it's been such an honor to be able to fly them. Of course, Doug Hurley was actually the pilot of the final space shuttle mission, STS-135, back in 2011. And honestly, when I heard that he was assigned to this mission, uh, I I cried because, you know, just to have the opportunity to return the pilot of that final mission to the space station uh, in in this capacity was is so cool. Uh, and I just I I've I've loved following this mission uh, since the moment that we started training for it here in Hawthorne. Well, we know that they're ready. They've and all of their suit checkouts, everything to get themselves to this point. And once we begin these events, they're gonna keep a very close eye. As again, crew is always in the loop to step in, but Dragon going to be executing all of these uh, different maneuvers and separation events automatically uh, via a pre-programmed timeline. Uh, we're continuing to count down. Uh, we'll have our first maneuver in a little under 13 minutes. We're a little over 15 minutes from the claw separation. Uh, that claw connecting the service module to the, uh, the Dragon capsule itself, a series of quick disconnects uh, will retract, cutting off any of the uh, fluid and data paths between the two. And then shortly after that, uh, just a few seconds later, the trunk will separate. And then we will be just less than five minutes away from that deorbit burn. Again, deorbit burn expected to last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Now, of course, during re-entry, Bob and Doug will be experiencing a couple of Gs. We're anticipating them to, to feel about four Gs during re-entry. This will make it a little difficult for them to move their arms around. Not impossible, um, but essentially what they're doing right now is reviewing uh, all of the event details for splashdown. Uh, making sure that they, and I've said this before, they have rehearsed this both uh, via, they've rehearsed the sequence of events in person with the recovery team, as well as through simulations here at Mission Control, uh, or at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. So at this point, uh, because it will be difficult for them to maybe flip through to the exact part of the procedure they might want to review during the actual re-entry event itself, they are, uh, they are reviewing those now in preparation for that splashdown or for the re-entry sequence. We've got another Twitter question. This from, from one from Laura Mountain. This one's pretty cool. Uh, is it quiet in the Dragon or does it sound like an airplane? Well, it doesn't sound like an airplane, at least not right now, as they're still flying through the vacuum of space. There's, there's none of that rushing air. Uh, they'll get some of that uh, once they're further down uh, during their descent. Um, and then they're also able to hear when the Draco thrusters fire, 
Um, and one of the really cool things they've done to train the crew is uh, SpaceX had a number of microphones placed throughout the cabin during that Demo-1 flight last year. And they were able to record what it sounded like inside through all of the major, uh, all of the major burns, the launch, the descent, landing, everything. And in the trainer upstairs here at Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters, they have speakers set up where as they're doing simulations or practice runs of the different phases of the mission, they're able to hear what it should sound like inside Dragon as they're going through that. So I know that's one thing Bob pointed out is one of the things they're looking for is, does, does this sound like I was expecting it to? Does, does this look like, is that a light I'm supposed to see? All of those different things that for them is like reflex by the time they've trained it this much. At this moment, we are less than 10 minutes away from this sequence starting. We are just about nine minutes away, in fact. And first we'll see that uh, maneuver where we'll get in the proper attitude or point Dragon really in the right direction for the claw and trunk separation. Uh, we're essentially gonna do a, a 90 degree yaw maneuver, turn Dragon sideways uh, to, to make sure the trunk goes out and away, uh, not coming out uh, in front of or behind the capsule, essentially re-entering the atmosphere with the capsule. We're gonna avoid that. Uh, and then Dragon will position itself for the deorbit burn. It's going to point those forward bulkhead thrusters um, into the direction that it's currently traveling. This is called a retrograde maneuver. And this is done specifically to, uh, we're gonna slow the capsule down, but more than anything, we're changing the the perigee or the lowest point of the capsule's orbit. Again, essentially putting it up on an intersection point uh, with that spot in the Gulf where we're coming home. Eight minutes, Kate. We are getting close.
Snapdragon SpaceX for deorbit sequence. Go ahead. All right, Doug, we are five minutes out from deorbit sequence start. In addition, uh, just wanted to inform you, we are expecting some ratty calm during claw and trunk set due to vehicle orientation. Okay, copy. We see 4.45 left for the uh, slew, and then uh, ratty calm during the uh, claw set. Good read back, Doug. Kate, we are almost four minutes away from this starting. Yeah, we just heard the call out there, confirmation from SpaceX core down here at Mission Control uh, to Crew Dragon that we now under five, but at the time of the call, five minutes away from deorbit sequence start. Uh, so like we've been mentioning before, that deorbit sequence will involve uh, separating from the trunk and performing the deorbit burn. Uh, as you may have noticed on your uh, the ground tracking map that we've been showing you before, Bob and Doug were in their last orbit around Earth. Uh, I, I can't remember what the number was that you, you quoted earlier, Dan, but they have done thousands of orbits around Earth during their two-month uh, duration on station. So it is really exciting that the line that we see on that trajectory map uh, is no longer, a, you yeah. know, fully around it. They're they're coming home. We're not we're not seeing two lines showing what their next orbit is going to be. They are on their final orbit of planet Earth, um, and this is their 1,024th orbit around our planet since they launched back in May uh, of earlier this year. So we're counting down. We're under three minutes away from that first maneuver, and that's going to be a slew, as you heard Doug radio down. Uh, and that's essentially, we're going to change the attitude. We're going to use those Draco thrusters to essentially spin Dragon about 90 degrees to the side uh, so we can uh, jettison that trunk. Um, and that'll be done in kind of two stages. We'll do the claw separation and then the trunk separation. Two minutes, 32 seconds, mm -hmm. and counting. This is where things really pick up. This is where we really commit to coming home. And this is where we're in kind of the final stages of Bob and Doug's trip in outer space. And pretty soon we'll be seeing them in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Well, they are staying comfortable and continuing to monitor data and telemetry in the vehicle. Uh, Dragon is actually doing a couple of things itself to prepare for this deorbit sequence. Um, again, it's doing these things autonomously. Uh, it's isolating the thermal control system loops from the radiator. This is the system that will help keep Bob and Doug cool uh, while they are re-entering the atmosphere. Like we've said before, the external temperature will reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and that thermal control system is uh, what helps keep them cool during that time. Also, Dragon is initiating uh, the separation of the claw mechanism, which will terminate the data, the power, and the fluid and the fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. So right now, the vehicle is preparing to execute that, and we are anticipating execution of claw separation uh, in three minutes and 35 seconds. So, <laughs> you know, we've been here for <laughs> 10 hours, hours, I think, at this point. Uh, uh, the webcast as a whole has been going on for almost a uh, little bit less than 24 hours. So, you know, we're in the final moments here as Dragon is beginning its, its journey home uh, to bring Bob and Doug back to Earth. Yeah, this is, this is the moment that Dragon is in the position to start coming home. Uh, the recovery team's already on station. They have been for a while out there off the coast of Pensacola. We are less than a minute from starting all of these carefully choreographed sequences to essentially split Dragon in half, get rid of that trunk so we have the capsule. I'll point the heat shield back down towards Earth following that deorbit burn, and then we bring them home. We are just about 30 seconds away now from maneuvering Dragon to get ready to get rid of that claw first 
and then that trunk separation. There will be about a 35 second difference uh, or 35 second jump from separating the claw to separating the trunk. And we'll keep our eyes on the ground track for you and make sure we get kind of exact locations of when these separation events are occurring. Uh, we're, we're looking for both the claw and the trunk to separate cleanly, and then it'll be less than five minutes until we do the deorbit burn. Yeah, and after that, it'll... Dragon SpaceX, deorbit sequence start. All right. Great news. Never happy. All right, so the Draco thrusters on Dragon starting to fire. It's now moving its way over to the trunk jettison attitude. We should be about two minutes away from the claw separation. For those of you that are just tuning in, you are just in time. <laughs> At this point in the mission, we are now beginning to execute the final steps of Dragon Endeavor's return to Earth. Uh, right now, we are performing the claw separation slew, which basically means Dragon is maneuvering itself into position, uh, into the proper attitude in order to separate the Dragon trunk. Uh, and that will be initiated first uh, by separation of the claw. The claw is the mechanism that attaches uh, the trunk and the uh, excuse me and the capsule together. The claw is what delivers power and telemetry and fluids, and we need to expose the heat shield. Uh, right now, the trunk is blocking that, so we will jettison the trunk, and we will um, then have uh, uh, allow us to maneuver into the proper attitude to perform the deorbit burn which Dragon has performed a number of burns so far overnight uh, and this early this morning. And this will be the final burn that the vehicle has to perform for this mission. And we just heard confirmation Dragon's in the trunk separation attitude. We are now standing by for claw separation. And we just heard confirmation. Confirmation of claw set. And with the claw separated, we're now standing by for the trunk separation in less than 30 seconds. Ten seconds till trunk separation. And we just heard confirmation of trunk separation. A trunk separation coming at 10.52 a.m. Pacific with Dragon flying over the Indian Ocean just off to the west of Australia. Dragon SpaceX, we show nominal trunk jettison. Oh yeah, we felt it. All right, so the crew just got the call. Nominal trunk separation, that's exactly what we were looking for. Next up is gonna be that de that deorbit burn. Again, this is the longest burn of their trip home. This is the longest firing of those thrusters and the last time we're using those forward bulkhead thrusters. Exactly. Uh, those forward bulkhead thrusters, like Dan just said, that's what we're using to perform the deorbit burn. Once we uh, do that, we will then be able, that deorbit burn will last for 11 and a half minutes. Once that is completed, we don't need to use those thrusters anymore. So we will close and lock the nose cone in preparation for re-entry.
So we're a little under three and a half minutes from the start of the deorbit burn. Again, our sequence of events has started. We we're able to separate that claw at 10.51 a.m. Pacific. at 17.51 GMT or universal time. And then at 10.52, just a minute later, the trunk separating while Dragon was flying just off to the west of Australia. So claw separated, trunk separated. Next up, the orbit burn. Yeah, right now, uh, Dragon is running exclusively on battery power now that the trunk is separated. Also, right now, uh, telemetry is looking really good for the vehicle. Uh, the nitrox system is primed for cabin and suit cooling, and the heat shield is exposed and ready for atmos atmospheric re-entry. Like I said before, that nitrox system, which is uh, essentially the air that we breathe every day down here on Earth, uh, nitrogen, oxygen combination, a mi mixture. Uh, it's the same stuff that they put in your scuba tank if you are a scuba diver. Uh, the nitrox system is used to cool the cabin and the suit uh, to keep the crew comfortable during the re-entry phase. Uh, they will actually have cold air flowing through the their suits themselves, uh, as well as through the cabin itself. So a two-pronged approach to maintaining a comfortable, a comfortable temperature there inside the capsule. Uh, like we said, uh, the next event that we have coming up will be the deorbit burn, uh, which we're expecting that to commence in one minute and 40 seconds. According to the ground tracking map there, Dragon is approaching the southwestern coast of Australia. Right, and we are we less are, than a... We're excited. Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> we are inside a minute to deorbit burn. And again, one more time, this is this is the long one. This is expected to last 11 minutes, 22 seconds. This is that burn that commits the dragon to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And you can get kind of a sense of just how far they're going to go. By the time they fire this burn, they're just gonna be off to the southwest of Australia. And this is going to realign their orbit to intersect with that point off the coast of Pensacola where they're gonna be splashing down. Yeah, this is the moment where Dragon is fully committed to the re-entry point. Uh, we, again, we are aiming for just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Our recovery ship Go Navigator is ready and waiting to begin the recovery process right after splashdown occurs. Once again, uh, if you're just joining us, we are now in the final steps of the deorbit sequence, uh, the deorbit burn will be starting here in just a couple of seconds. And we just heard confirmation, the orbit burn has begun. That uh, coming at 10.56 a.m. Pacific. Again, while the Dragon spacecraft just off the southwestern coast of Australia. So here we go, <laughs> 11 more minutes to go. I'm ready and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's safe to say that Bob and Doug are ready. They, they've done a number of interviews over the last few weeks while they were on station and just the excitement and the enthusiasm for the mission is, is palpable. Uh, just the opportunity to be able to fly these two incredible humans to the International Space Station and back is such an honor and uh, we're just really excited to get our space dads home safely and back to their families as quickly as possible. This deorbit burn that we are currently in, it will last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Already a little more than a minute 10 in counting, so we have about 10 minutes to go. Just heard a, a call. The propulsion system performing nominally. That's the word we always want to hear. We always like to hear. So just under 10 minutes to go left in this burn. 
And all within the last 10 minutes, again, it seemed like we had slow progress of events all morning and then boom, within the last 10 minutes, we had a couple of things happening. Uh, Dragon maneuvered itself into the appropriate position to jettison its trunk uh, and it did so successfully, nominally, and then it initiated the deorbit burn just a couple minutes ago. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time those four forward Draco thrusters will fire, forward kind of meaning at the top of the capsule. Dragon Endeavor has not yet entered Earth's atmosphere, but this deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site in the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, uh, although we can't see it at the moment, Bob and Doug are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration, uh, Draco fire, excuse me, Draco thruster firings and trajectory details, such as entry angle, capsule perigee, and how much distance is remaining until that deorbit burn terminates. So Dragon is flying itself, so all they really have to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs, keep tabs on things. So while this burn is completing, again, we're just a few minutes into it. It'll last 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Uh, we, we have a couple more events coming up uh, afterward in, uh, let's, let me check my timeline here real quick. In 40, just under 44 minutes, uh, we will have the initial parachute deployment. So uh, that is essentially when we will be deploying the drogue parachutes, the small parachutes that are designed to uh, further slow down the capsule as, as it is re-entering the atmosphere, as well as stabilizing it. And then a minute after that, we will deploy the drogue parachutes. And that is targeted for 11.44 a.m. Pacific, 18.44 uh, Universal. And then just a couple minutes after that, we will have splashdown. So, so again, that's all in just under 45, 44 minutes. Right now, we are performing the deorbit burn. We've got a little over seven minutes left in this burn. And the only performance call we've gotten so far is everything's still looking good with the propulsion system on Dragon. Uh, once this burn completes, we will have kind of a couple minutes, uh, about three minutes to catch our breath before things pick right back up and we get the nose cone closed. Uh, and then there'll be a bit more of a gap. And at that point, uh, they will maneuver Dragon to its entry attitude, essentially heat shield pointed down and into the uh, the line of velocity and that heat shield protecting them from the, the heat of re-entry. Uh, temperatures getting up to about 3,500 degrees uh, on the Dragon spacecraft, but everything looking good. We're about five minutes into this deorbit burn. Again, it started right at 10.56 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 17.56 56 GMT. Uh, Dragon was flying about 260 statute miles uh, just off the southwestern coast of Australia. So right now, during this burn, the, the we just heard a call that we're halfway through the burn and everything is looking great, everything performing nominally. Uh, during this burn right now, Bob and Doug are currently monitoring the deorbit tool, which, like I said earlier, uh, captures things like the perigee, the uh, reentry interface, uh, how much time, or excuse me, how many mile, how much distance remains uh, before the burn itself. Uh, is terminated. They're also monitoring the burn duration and uh, the firing of those Draco thrusters located there at the f uh, on the forward bulkhead of the capsule. Uh, there on your screen, you actually can see what Bob and Doug are seeing right now. Uh, that is that tool on their screen. So uh, on the left and the right of the center screen, uh, that is the deorbit. Uh, 
that that is the deorbit monitor, monitoring tool. Just past seven minutes into the burn, a little over four minutes remaining. Everything's still looking good with Dragon Ship Endeavor's Dior of Burn to commit it to coming home. Everything continuing to be on track for our splashdown. Again, our splashdown time uh, right at 11.48 and 24 seconds uh, Pacific was the calculated time. Uh, wouldn't, it would be typical if we're a couple seconds on either side. Uh, but that time is 1848 GMT or universal. But we're, we're already through several of the really major steps to initiate this re-entry. The claw is separated, the trunk is gone, the deorbit burn has begun, and we're more than halfway through, just a little under three and a half minutes remaining. There on your screen is a shot of our mission control center here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where the Dragon operators and mission leaders are there monitoring Dragon's progress. They continue to watch the propulsion data and all the GNC data, uh, making sure that everything is looking healthy and nominal. We're just about two minutes, 30 seconds until the end of this burn. We'll listen for the call out up to the crew uh, on the performance of the burn, and then they'll start moving into the next steps. Again, we'll get about a three minute breather before the next major milestone comes up when we get ready to close the nose cone, uh, that protecting the docking ring, guidance, navigation and control uh, sensors, and also these four forward bulkhead thrusters that are currently performing the deorbit burn uh, during the actual reentry process. So we are at just under two minutes from the conclusion of the deorbit burn. Again, Dragon is committed to its splashdown point. There is no going back. Yeah, we already have the recovery team ready and on standby. They've been there uh, for quite some time now. Um, here and we have about 90 seconds left in the burn. Weather looking great at the splashdown site off Pensacola. Uh, winds uh, just around two and a half miles per hour. Uh, sea being described as like glass by the core here in Hawthorne radioing up to the crew. Ended up getting fantastic weather for this first crude splashdown of Dragon. We are one minute away from the end of deorbit burn. Again, this burn is placing Dragon on its final trajectory to the landing site off of the coast of Pensacola, Florida. That is in the Gulf of Mexico. And our recovery vessel, Go Navigator, and the recovery team are ready and waiting to see Bob and Doug come back through the atmosphere. Like we said, this orbit burn, uh, during this two orbit burn, not be entering the atmosphere just yet. Uh, that won't happen for about an hour.
Dragon, SpaceX, deorbit burn complete, performance nominal, nose cone closure initiated. Nominal burn, nose cone in work. All right. Deorbit burn complete. We heard the call, nominal burn. Bob and Doug are on their way back home. This burn commits them to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Whew, all, there, all we have <laughs> left now is to wait. That was really one of the last major moments uh, before they start re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll have the nose cone closure coming up next. Uh, that should be coming uh, in just a couple of minutes as uh, we had about a three minute span uh, between the end of the Dior burn and that moment. Yeah, the nose cone is actually currently in the closing process, so it doesn't just snap shut. Uh, it does slowly close and uh, lock. So right now that nose cone is in the process of moving of it, moving back into the closed position. And uh, we will hear the call out for whenever it has fully closed and whenever uh, the latches have secured. seeing some data it looks like it's about halfway there uh, it's open a little bit more than 90 degrees i think the the exact count was 110 degrees uh opening range or range of motion for the nose cone uh, so we're a little more than halfway now to getting that nose cone closed So I have just heard that we have a visual on nose cone closure. So it'll take a minute for the hooks to close in. They close in uh, a series. So the first series will close and then the second will follow. And that'll take about a minute to complete. All right, well, as we just wait for the finish to that nose cone closure, uh, we'll have a bit of time again. We'll have about 20 minutes uh, or a little, little over 21 from right now until we really start re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. We're expecting that entry interface uh, in about 21 minutes. And then right around that time, we'll also be looking for that blackout we've been talking about. Uh, we've had a little bit of what we call ratty calm at this point. So you'll hear kind of some sporadic uh, interruptions in the audio transmission just because of how Dragon was oriented um, for the, uh, the trunk jettison and for the actual deorbit burn. Uh, but that, that blackout period will be due to the plasma that builds up around the capsule, uh, interfering with those antennas either sending or receiving data. So I've heard the call out that the first set of hooks for nose cone closure are in motion. So these, this will complete in two sets. The first set is now in motion. So really good news to hear that. Everything looking good so far. Like I mentioned before, uh, in the background, Dragon has uh, inhibited the forward uh, bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete that deorbit burn. Uh, this is to ensure that it's safe to latch that nose cone shut for reentry. Also, the vehicle has initiated the nitrox purge. Nitrox is simply a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. It's what we breathe. Uh, and the, the nit nitrox that is being purged into the system is cooled. Uh, so allowing that cool air to circulate around the cabin, but also inside of Bob and Doug's suits, uh, will help to keep them cool and comfortable during re-entry, uh, which will be coming up in about 20 minutes. We're currently tracking 23 minutes and 20 seconds until entry begins. So 
So in case you're just joining us at this point, the nose cone has closed. The forward thrusters have been, uh, have been disabled and we are latching the nose cone. Currently underway with the first set of hooks. The first of two sets. And we just had confirmation that the first set of hooks will begin to close as well. As we mentioned, after this nose cone's fully closed, we'll have a couple of minutes to catch our breath again, about 20 minutes or just under 20 minutes until Dragon will start to maneuver itself to the entry attitude, essentially pointing the heat shield in the direction of travel as it's gonna be leading the way through their re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll look to uh, run into that communications blackout at about 36 minutes after the hour expecting that to last for about six minutes. And then we'll get that back shortly before we uh, deploy the drogue parachutes, followed uh, just less than a minute later by the main parachutes. And by that point, hopefully we should have some views of Dragon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and parachuting to a splashdown in the Gulf. So there in the front row of Mission Control in the center, you can see CEO Elon Musk and our President Gwen Shotwell sitting side by side at those center consoles. In addition to those two, the room is filled with Dragon operators and mission leaders who are continuing to monitor the health and telemetry of the crew and the capsule. Right now, nose cone closure is underway. The first of two sets of hook latching has completed. And we just heard a call Dragon, out that the nose cone. SpaceX co nose cone is secure for entry. Happy, we see it on board. All right, great confirmation there. Back and forth from Mission Control here to Bob and Doug up in Dragon Endeavor. Uh, that Bob and Doug have can also confirmed on their displays that the nose cone has closed nominally and it is secure for entry. And so that nose cone, nose cone close completion. A lot of tongue twisters with this right now. Uh, coming uh, with Dragon still flying over the South Pacific. Uh, it is on its way home. We're going to gradually start to see its altitude dip. Uh, right now, already only 207 miles over the Earth's surface. It was at about 260 miles when it was still uh, over on the other side of the Pacific Ocean off the southwestern coast of Australia when it fired its engines for that deorbit burn. Uh, so its altitude going to continue to drop. Uh, once it gets to uh, about 100 kilometers in altitude or about 62 miles, um, it's going to begin what's known as entry interface. And that's when it really begins to start to feel uh, the effects of the Earth's atmosphere will once again be experiencing lift and drag uh, as it's no longer in that near vacuum environment in low Earth orbit. So we're essentially stepping into the second half of entry. Dragon is now beginning to flush nitrox into the cabin and continuing to top it off in Bob and Doug's suits as well. Again, this is cool air essentially flowing through the cabin and the suits. Uh, this is what will allow them and the cabin itself to remain comfortable uh, during re-entry while those external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
At this point in time, Dragon's orientation is such that the heat shield is pointing forward, if you will, uh, leading the capsule toward the landing site. If you've been following along over the last couple days, you know that weather has been a big ticket item for us. Uh, the recovery team has been busy over the last week working to determine uh, the selection of a landing site in order to increase the options for space station departures. Uh, the team identified a total of seven possible splashdown locations. In order to meet NASA's timeline requirements for crew recovery, these potential splashdown locations have to be close to a port and uh, they have to be close to medical facilities. So with all of that in mind, you add the ever-evolving weather conditions of Florida, but also that tropical storm Isaia that was moving through. Uh, and it's easy to see how determining that landing site is a is quite a complex process. Uh, since Dragon is capable of splashdown on either side of the Florida panhandle, uh, we in fact have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels ready to support. Uh, one in the Gulf of Mexico, which is what we're utilizing today, Go Navigator, and the other located uh, off the east coast of Florida, able to service landing sites in the Atlantic Ocean. That one is Go Searcher. Like I mentioned, today we'll be splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Go Navigator, that recovery ship I just mentioned, is in place and ready and waiting for Bob and Doug. Uh, the WB-57 plane, if it hasn't taken off already, I'm sure it will be very soon. It's, uh, yep, it's in the air. Okay, great. Uh, that's what will provide our first views of Dragon during re-entry. We'll get a thermal cam off of that airplane, allowing us to see the capsule as it is re-entering the atmosphere. If you were tuned in for our demo one broadcast, uh, uh, there, it, it was basically a, a big ball of light <laughs> coming at us. We'll also have cameras on board the recovery vessel, so as Dragon gets closer uh, we, and is, is deploying those parachutes, we will also be able to have hopefully some really clear footage of that all occurring as well. All right, so Dragon's altitude continuing to dip. Right now about 174 miles over planet Earth. We're under 11 and a half minutes from where we expect to hit entry interface. So that's where Dragon will really start feeling the effects of being in a denser atmosphere. Um, and then we are still tracking that blackout to come uh, right around that same time. We are under 27 minutes away from splashdown. So we are under 27 minutes away from Bob and Doug being on planet Earth for the first time since May 30th. To kind of put everything in perspective, uh, you know, the Dragon capsule departed from the International Space Station several hours ago, uh, but according to what Dan just said, it's essentially halfway home just based on altitude alone. So the International Space Station is about 250 miles above Earth's surface. I think right now it's between 250 and 300. I think right now it's about 263 miles uh, above Earth's surface. So based on uh, that telemetry that, that Dan just read off is from an altitude standpoint, Dragon is halfway home <laughs> and yet that second half is going to be covered in the next 27-ish minutes uh, while we wait for a splashdown and recovery versus the several hours that we've been covering since yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, and we will continue to see its speed drop as it's dropping out of orbit. It's starting to hit the atmosphere. It's starting to slow from the effects of that friction, uh, generating the heat on the heat shield and building up the plasma eventually around the spacecraft. Its speed's gonna continue to drop. It's already below 17,000 miles an hour, and it'll drop to essentially a terminal velocity of about 350 miles an hour, right as those drogue chutes deploy. And those are gonna pop out uh, when sensors on the Dragon spacecraft, uh, both GPS and pressure sensors, tell the spacecraft it's at the right altitude, and then those will automatically deploy. Those drogues coming out of the top section of the spacecraft uh, using two mortars, or pyrotechnics essentially, to deploy those to do the initial slowing and stabilizing of the Dragon capsule. 
Yeah, then after that, the main parachutes will pop out and further decelerate it to about 119 miles per hour. Uh, and then that will continue to decelerate. And by the time that the capsule is splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico, it's only going 15, 16 miles per hour. So significant reduction in speed there uh, over, over just the course of a couple minutes. Uh, that, of course, is you know, a pretty comfortable speed. Uh, the way that the uh, astronauts have described it uh, previously with other, other types of missions also landing down, uh, doing land landings at about the same rate, they said it feels like you're in a, a, a minor fender bender. Yeah, you're definitely running into something. You'll feel it, but uh, they do a lot of work uh, with the seats and the restraints with these crew members just to make sure... Uh, while it may be a fender bender, you got more than a seatbelt essentially holding you in. So they are they are very secure in their suits and in their seats, and they're going to stay in there even after Dragon touches down. We'll still have communication with Dragon. Uh, once they're in the water, it'll stay powered on. Uh, probably most importantly, the air conditioner will continue to work uh, while they're in the capsule uh, in the now Gulf of Mexico and much warmer temperatures than uh, they've seen for uh, the last couple of months. Uh, and we'll still be able to talk to them from here in Hawthorne, and the recovery teams will be able to as well. Yeah. One of the things we might see them do, uh, depending on uh, sea states and everything after they touch down and the crew themselves, uh, they'll still have a couple of demonstration tasks potentially to carry out. Uh, they have a satellite phone inside of the capsule that has its own uh, satellite antenna integrated into Dragon, and they're able to use that independent of Dragon's communication system. So uh, one thing we might hear them do is do a test call on that to the teams here uh, in Hawthorne. We wouldn't be able to hear the call, but you would hear the, uh, the go to do it over the Dragon to ground audio that we've been listening to this entire time. So. Still have a couple of demonstration steps, essentially, as again, this is a test flight. This is the flight to really prove out Dragon systems, to bring crew members from Kennedy Space Center to the space station and return them safely to Earth. And so far we have had a flawless ride downhill. We've completed the deorbit burn. Dragon is continuing to drop down. It's right now at about 132 miles over the Pacific Ocean. Pretty soon we're gonna see its ground track cross over Central America, out over the Gulf, culminating in that splashdown in the Gulf just off the coast of Pensacola. Dragon SpaceX for entry brief. Okay, Doug, we have no update to timing because the burn went great and your vehicle is still looking really good for entry. No uh, health issues at this time. Okay, Dragon Cassie, thank you. Uh, in addition, the uh, recovery team is go and the weather is still great. Uh, winds are about two knots and waves about a, uh, one foot from the ship. They're reporting very calm. How copy? Copy good weather at the uh, landing area. Thank you. Okay, and uh, last piece is that we do expect some additional ready calm during entry prep two due to vehicle attitude. Um, so if you can get us your entry check uh, report uh, a little bit prior to entry prep two, we'd appreciate it. Copy, we'll go. Okay, thanks, Doug. So there we just had a bit of a briefing between Mission Control and Bob and Doug up in Crew Endeavor, just confirming with them that the do orbit burn was great and that the timing on their pads doesn't need to be updated. Uh, we are able to upload new trajectory calculations, including times that remain live depending on uh, you know, how the burn goes. And at this point in time, those don't need to be updated. It is important that they do remain accurate because Bob and Doug, their primary mission right now is to continue to monitor uh, the vehicle status and telemetry and data being presented to them on their touch on their touchscreen displays in front of them. Uh, and so 
during the more dynamic events, uh, they certainly want to be aware when things like parachute deploy will be happening and when splashdown is, is, is expected. So making sure that the timeline of events, the sequencing is accurate, is certainly important for, in order for them to stay aware and updated of upcoming events. Just another quick position check. Dragon still out over the Central Pacific, down to about 108 miles in altitude. And we're expecting that entry interface to come up in the next four minutes or so. Again, at that point, Dragon should be at an altitude of right around 62 statute miles, or about 100 kilometers. And that's when it really starts to feel the effects of the atmosphere. It starts to experience the uh, uh, lift and drag and other atmospheric effects it's been free from while flying in the near vacuum of low Earth orbit. So continuing to drop in altitude, still looking for an on-time splashdown, should just be about 19 minutes from now. And just a reminder, we do have that blackout period coming. So as they continue to dip in the Earth's atmosphere and get lower and lower, the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker and it's going to generate more and more heat, eventually heating up the outside of Dragon to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And as it hits that peak heating, it'll also be forming a plasma around the spacecraft. So we do expect to lose calm for about six minutes. SpaceX Dragon crew entry preps are complete. SpaceX copies and true prep complete. Thank you. The call from spacecraft commander Doug Hurley, entry preps are complete. So they are on board, they are monitoring, they are ready to come home. Yeah, and as of right now, uh, entry prep should have also included uh, final configuration of their flight suits. So we had a question uh, from our social media earlier if the visors will be up or down. Uh, those visors should be down at this point as part of that entry prep check. In that last briefing, we also heard that the weather is looking good. In a previous report, the phrasing was, it looks like glass. And that is certainly ideal for a water splashdown. Uh, that being said, the recovery timeline, um, you know, Bob and Doug should be out of the capsule within an hour after splashing down. So good to hear that the weather is good. We saw blue skies and a couple of white fluffy clouds out there uh, in the Gulf of Mexico as we got views from our recovery vessel, Go Navigator. But glad to hear that conditions are sustaining and that uh, winds also are looking really good around two and two, two and a half miles per hour. So hardly anything at all. Really couldn't ask for better conditions for a splashdown day. We, we kind of threaded the needle once again, almost like we did on launch with the weather today. Um, you, your, your upper limits for wind were about 10 miles an hour. So we're, we're well behold, below that threshold for a splashdown today. The Dragon coming up on 82 miles in altitude, continuing to dip down. We're expecting that entry interface to start pretty soon, where the vehicle itself's really going to start heating up. It's going to continue to use its Draco thrusters to maintain its attitude as it continues through the Earth's atmosphere. And we'll have that calm blackout coming up in just a couple of minutes as well. Or the cabin purge has started again. This is when they're going to flush the cabin of Dragon with cooled air. They're also going to do a suit purge, uh, running cooled nitrox through the suits for Bob and Doug just to keep things at a comfortable temperature for them as the capsule goes through the re-entry and starts to heat up.
So like we said, we are anticipating a brief blackout period where we're unable to communicate with the capsule. That's, uh, we're expecting that to start in exactly three minutes. Uh, that will last for six minutes total. And during that time, we will be unable to command the vehicle or receive telemetry. That being said, Dragon is designed to be fully autonomous. So it's driving itself anyway. <laughs> So Bob and Doug uh, will, will stay fastened in their seats. Uh, like I said, that anticipated loss of signal, or as you'll hear it called LOS, is anticipated to last for just six minutes. During that blackout period, the capsule will, uh, will encounter what's known as entry interface. This is when the capsule is now uh, really in the Earth's atmosphere and beginning to be subject to aerodynamic forces. Uh, this is also when a lot of that friction will begin to build up and raise the external temperatures. Dragon SpaceX, we show two minutes until predicted calm blackout. We will see you on the other side at 1842. <laughs> Dragon Cappies, 1842, we'll talk to you then. So there's that heads up uh, communication from Mission Control to Dragon Endeavor, confirming that comms blackout. Like I was saying, during the blackout, the Dragon capsule will be going through entry interface where it is encountering aerodynamic forces really starting to build up uh, the external temperature as it, and that external temperature will reach about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the, the, the interior of the cabin is environmentally cooled, so Bob and Doug will, should, be, should remain comfortable during their descent. There will be cool air flowing not only through the cabin itself, but also through their suits. The suits have sensors on them that are able to detect the temperature inside that suit. And once, it, once uh, that sensor reads that uh, it has reached the, the maximum temperature threshold, uh, it'll flush the suit with some cool air and, uh, and really circulate and, and cool it down. All right, well, we are right around that estimated blackout time. As we heard the call, we'll see them on the other side, expected to regain that communication at about 42 minutes after the hour. So for these next six minutes, they're already less than 60 miles in altitude. And this is when the capsule is really heating up during that reentry, reaching temperatures of around 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. As again, you're essentially hitting the atmosphere at more than 17,000 miles an hour and the friction building up that plasma around the spacecraft. And that's what's gonna prevent us from talking to Bob and Doug or getting data back from the spacecraft for the next six minutes. These flight computers are in control though. It's going to continue to maintain its appropriate trajectory and attitude, uh, having attitude determination devices on board the capsule, not reliant on communications with satellites. And it's going to continue dragging down the correct path for this splashdown off the coast of Pensacola. So uh, we are in that blackout period. We're gonna continue to stand by until we get them on the other side. And just about two minutes after we get acquisition of signal AOS back with Dragon, we're going to be looking for those parachutes. And we should hopefully be getting some views from a couple of our assets out at the landing zone, including our WB-57 high altitude research plane, which is going to be relying on Dragon's telemetry to actually lock onto it in the sky and give us an infrared view of the capsule during the final stages of reentry. We're going to be looking for the drogue deploys at about 44 minutes after the hour. Those will be two drogue shoots that are going to come out when the vehicle is still moving at about 350 miles an hour. And it'll be at an altitude of about 18,000 feet. They'll come out and do some initial slowing 
and stabilization of the spacecraft. And then uh, less than a minute later, they'll detach and the four main parachutes will deploy. You'll see them come out and look kind of closed up initially, and then they'll do what's known as reefing, opening up in really two different stages just to minimize the immediate loads on the parachutes themselves. Uh, those main parachutes will come out at an altitude of about 6,500 feet, with Dragon already slowed down to 119 miles an hour. And they'll do the rest of the slowing the whole way down until we splash down in the Gulf of Mexico. We should be 10 minutes away from splashdown. So right now we're getting our cameras on the WB-57 airplane, which is in the area, uh, getting those cameras ready to give us our first glimpse. And we should still have about three minutes left, a little less than three minutes until we anticipate reacquiring our signal and our connection with Bob and Doug and the Dragon spacecraft. If you're just tuning in, we are in a blackout period that we were expecting. Uh, this blackout period will last a total of six minutes and we're about halfway through there now. Uh, at the moment, Dragon is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and due to the plasma building up on the exterior of the vehicle, uh, we're unable to communicate or send commands, but Dragon is fully autonomous. It is steering itself. Uh, and right now, Bob and Doug are flying home. Dragon SpaceX com check. So we're still inside that anticipated blackout window. It does look like we are getting uh, maybe some sporadic data starting to peek through. This is why you heard that communications check with the spacecraft. Dragon SpaceX com check. Never had you loud and clear. We're about 3.9 G. Copy. We've got you 5x5 five five as well, Doug. Looking good, and you can expect an automated shoot deployment. Copy. Automated shoot deployment. All right. Really good news there. We have come out of the blackout period and we have reestablished connection with. Dragon Endeavor with NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley on board. We were able to reacquire that communication a little bit earlier than expected. And now we are just waiting. We should just be about two and a half minutes away from that initial drogue shoot deploy. Yeah, two minutes and 26 seconds. A GPS has converged. Copy that. You may have heard earlier that Bob and Doug are currently experiencing 3.5 Gs. Not too bad. That's about what they pulled during the ascent phase. Just like a mild roller coaster. So the vehicle is now over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it is approaching the landing zone uh, off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. And there we have our first shot. There it is, this, the first view from the WB-57 airplane. It is dipping in and out a little bit. This is gonna be an infrared camera showing us Dragon re-entering. We have that comm back with Bob and Doug. Uh, you heard a GPS is converging. Uh, Dragon has uh, three GPS units that it uses uh, 
actually in the parachute deployment process uh, as it helps uh, along with the pressure sensors really give a solid altitude to the flight computers on when these are supposed to deploy. And we're standing by for the drogue chute deployments. We should be just under five minutes away from splashdown. Passing 15 kilometers, brace for drogue window. Captain, we're braced. Just about 14 kilometers in altitude, 8.4 miles, continuing to descend. There on your screen, we have a shot of the capsule as it is preparing to deploy those initial parachutes, the drogue parachutes. Again, these parachutes help slow the vehicle down even further and help stabilize in preparation for main chute deployment. Right about now, the capsule is going about 400 miles per hour, decelerating quickly. And standing by for drogue deploys. Visual, two drogues out. There on your screen, we have visual confirmation of those two drogue deployments. Happy two drogues. All right, so two of two, the drogues now out. They're going to do their slowing and stabilizing of the Dragon spacecraft. They should be detaching in just a few moments, and then we'll see four parachutes, the main parachutes deployed. Dragon under drogues. Drogue descent rate nominal. So the expected descent rate, the expected velocity under the drogues nominal, we're right at around 150 miles an hour and already dropping. You can see the drogues now detach. And there we have confirmation of deployment of the four main parachutes. We are visual on four chutes out. We are visual. Four main parachutes deployed. Four main. So at this point, the main parachutes have deployed. They are inflating, as you can see there on your screen, continuing to slow Dragon down significantly. We are anticipating splashdown in just under two minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah, we've already slowed the vehicle down to about 16 miles an hour. It's already less than a kilometer in altitude. Main chute descent rate nominal, passing through 700 meters. So at this point, Dragon has saved all propulsion systems on 600 board. 600 meters. 600 meters. And we're 600 meters above the Gulf of Mexico. Should be approximately a minute 30 from splashdown. Mission control team here in Hawthorne has reported the precise landing coordinates to the recovery team. They are standing by, ready to go get our space dads. Just passed about 300 meters, one minute till splashdown. Two hundred meters. We are braced for splashdown. Copy brace for splashdown. So there we heard Bob and Doug reporting that they are bracing for a splashdown. We should be able to see uh, the Gulf of Mexico here in the shot just momentarily as we're now just about 20 meters off the ocean.
Splashdown. As you can see on your screen, we have visual confirmation for Splashdown. SpaceX copies and concurs. We see Splashdown and Mains cut. Dragon Endeavor has returned home. NASA astronauts and Bob Endeavor and Doug. On behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth and thanks for flying SpaceX. <laughs> It was truly our honor and privilege to fly the flight of the uh, Crew Dragon and Endeavor. Congratulations, everybody, at SpaceX. Uh, all good, and we're uh, into section of four decimal eight zero zero. Thanks for those words, Doug, and we uh, copy that you are into uh, four decimal eight zero zero. So great news all around there. Our space dads are back on Earth after a 19-hour return journey from space. Dragon Endeavor has splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. And on your screen there, you can see our two fast boats, and they are indeed fast, <laughs> racing out to greet Dragon Endeavor as uh, it sits there. The first on there, we can see a view inside the capsule. Bob and Doug looking good. Although the communication was a little choppy, we did Space hear. Uh, Endeavor in three decimal one, we show ourselves in stable one. And SpaceX copies for uh, vehicle assessment, step three decimal one, stable one. Good news. So stable one, essentially. They're upright in the water, stable two. Uh, also another potential where it could be on its side or even upside down, but Dragon does have a water ballast system. Uh, to keep it upright where it's able to essentially pump seawater uh, into bladders in the service section of the capsule. But they're approaching, they touched down, uh, came right on time at 11.48 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1848 uh, UTC. Bob and Doug now in the water and the recovery ops, they've already begun. We're, we already see the, the fast boat starting to move in. Uh, we're still maintaining that good communication back uh, with Bob and Doug and the team here in Hawthorne. Uh, pretty soon we should be getting uh, the go for them to move in, begin their hypergall sniffs and uh, begin wrangling up those parachutes. But we can see Bob and Doug inside the capsule back on planet Earth. Yeah, those fast boats will be moving in to do a couple of things. Uh, they'll be performing what's known as a sniffer test. That's essentially to ensure that the air around the vehicle uh, doesn't have any toxic fumes from the hypergolic propellants on board. So once we get the all clear from there, uh, the water recovery lead will give the uh, will give the go for approach, and that's when the the first fast boat will actually approach the capsule hopefully give a little wave to Bob and Doug through the window. <laughs> and uh, one of the crew members will, uh, one of the team members will actually climb on top of Crew Dragon and begin to, um, begin to place the rigging equipment necessary to hoist Dragon out of the water. Oh, still getting a view from the WB, uh, the airplane flying overhead. It gave us those, those great views are really our first views of Bob and Doug reentering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, from up above. You can see the four parachutes in the water. Uh, we heard those were cut automatically uh, as expected by Dragon. Uh, so for now, the crew just standing by. Again, they're going to stay in their suits, in their seats. Uh, we're waiting for all these initial checks. Dragon SpaceX comm check. Loud and clear, how else? Loud and clear as well. Just wanted to verify a quick comm reconfiguration. Thank you. So essentially what just happened there is they reconfigured. Solo, if you can just relay the uh, status of the uh, fast boats and the recovery uh, as you get them, we would appreciate it. You bet. Absolutely, Doug. Uh, we'll go. So what just happened there, you, you heard uh, comms reconfiguration. That's essentially looping Bob and Doug's communication into the launch, or excuse me, into the recovery team uh, so that if not, they can hear feedback from Bob and Doug directly as well. Now, I, we talked a little bit about... SpaceX uh, Endeavor, you can let Ben and James know. Uh, we're doing pretty good so far. Okay, we'll let the flight docs know that you're feeling good so far. Thanks for that update. 
really good news there to hear that they're feeling good uh, and they can let the flight surgeons know that all is well inside Dragon Endeavor. All right, and it sounds like we do have uh, one of our folks that's on location there with the recovery forces, NASA's Brandy Dean. She's been, she's uh, joining us by satellite phone. Brandy, if you can hear me, I mean, what is it like right there on the water? What was it like to watch, watch them splash down? For the uh, test objective, so stand by at the console as we get it up and operating on the Okay, SpaceX copies. We'll be ready for that in just a couple minutes. We should have the go for you in just a moment. Please stand by. I can hear you, but there's a There in the center of your screen, Dragon Capsule, awaiting for the fast boats to approach and begin the rigging process. And there on the left-hand side of your screen, we can see that second fast boat come into view. Dragon SpaceX, we are go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personal personnel aside, alongside in just under a minute. Dragon copies, thank you. All right, so they're starting to move in. As Kate just said, that first boat's gonna go in, sniff around the capsule for any traces of hypergalls. The second one's gonna start rounding up the parachutes, uh, which we're getting some really cool views from the WV-57 still flying overhead. Uh, looking down, you can see the parachutes in the water and the second boat start to gather them up. Uh, We'll try one more time real quick. Uh, we have NASA's Brandy Dean out with the recovery forces. Brandy, if you can hear me, what was it like to watch this dragon come down under parachutes? Oh, it was amazing. I wish everybody could have had my view. It was such a beautiful sight. It's a gorgeous day. The water is calm. Really the best weather we could have asked for. Um, and we did, we heard the, um, the sonic booms as it made its way back. We were able to find it early on as the parachutes were deploying. So it was very exciting for everybody who was gathered here. That's incredible. We actually had some questions from people if you'd be able to hear the sonic boom and we weren't sure. So I'm really glad you just answered that for us. Um, I mean, we talked so much about the weather. You said it looks great. What, I mean, what was it like on the ride out there? Has it just been kind of clear skies and clear seas the whole way? I'm not sure if you can hear me right now, um, but I think you're asking about the weather, whether it was clear skies. There are just a kind of a circle of clouds along the horizon, very low, but um, the, the, we were able to see the parachute far above the clouds and then follow it all the way until it's blasted down. All right, well, we're not getting any views on the boat, so what kind of activity is taking place right now? We're able to see the fast boats approaching the capsule. Uh, what's everybody doing on the boat to just kind of get everything ready? Uh, the boat's also making its way for the capsule. I can't see it with my with my rear eyes um, yet, but we're getting closer. Um, everybody's been kind of standing by, um, holding ready positions for quite a while now. So as soon as it as soon as the splash, they'll be able to just sit in um, and start work on their own their own activities. All right, copy that. Well, we're gonna keep watching from here. Um, thanks for calling in and thanks for being out there with everybody and getting us these great views. It's really incredible. Uh, thanks, Brandy. We hope to get you back in port soon. Uh, and we'll talk to you back in Houston.
posted there on your screen. Uh, ooh, camera view change. That is a view coming to us from Go Navigator, the recovery vessel. Uh, the two fast boats are out there getting to getting ready to uh, basically uh, plot, or excuse me, install the rigging equipment required to hoist the dragon out of the water. Uh, one, the other fast boat is actually collecting the parachutes from the water. We definitely want to uh, bring those back on board with us. Uh, but shortly here, we should actually see one of the team members uh, crawl up onto the side of the capsule in order to install that, uh, install the rigging like I, I mentioned. That particular team member is highly experienced and highly trained, as you can imagine climbing on top of an oddly shaped thing in you know, the ocean <laughs> could be a little tricky. So uh, this person has undergone a lot, hours and hours of training and certification in order to perform this very important task. There on the right hand side of your screen, we see the second fast boat approaching. Uh, of course, both of these boats uh, needed to wait for their cue uh, from the water recovery lead in order to approach Dragon after splashdown. Uh, again, that was just to make sure that there weren't Dragon after splashdown. Uh, again, that was just to make sure that there weren't any toxic vapors in the air. Uh, and now that they got the all clear, we do see them begin to work uh, on and around the Dragon capsule. So even though the camera's a little shaky, uh, that water looks super, super duper uh, smooth, almost like glass, which is certainly ideal for a water recovery like today. Yeah, got to remember that this is a view from the, the main recovery vessel, which was still a few miles away from the splashdown Dragon point. Dragon SpaceX, we have hypercall sweeps and unfired ordnance checks uh, nominal. Rigor is on board the vehicle about two, five minutes until capsule lift. Copy that. Yep, we see them uh, walking outside, and uh, good news. All right, confirmation there that all of those hypergolic uh, vapor tests came out uh, positive, or rather negative, which is a positive thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the team was able to approach, and now the crew member that is installing the rigging is on top of the capsule. It's difficult to see there uh, because the slower vessel, that re the primary recovery ship, is a little further away. But as we heard, it's just a mere two and a half minutes until uh, they will be hoisted out of the water. Um, I'm sorry, tw 25 minutes, not... 2.5. I misheard that. Yeah. They're fast, but they're not that yeah. fast. Uh, we also have been hearing that uh, the secondary boat, which its primary mission in this case is securing those parachutes, uh, they've already got buoys attached to both droves and uh, two of the four mains and already had eyes on the other two, so they're moving through that work pretty quickly. Again, their primary responsibility, getting those parachutes together. Uh, the droves uh, detaching from the spacecraft uh, right before the deployment of the mains, the mains automatically detaching immediately as Dragon detected splashdown. Uh, all of that happening right per the timeline. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about the hardwired buttons that Bob and Doug have on their seats and in their control uh, displays, and cutting the, the main chutes is one of those buttons. In the event that they weren't automatically cut after splashdown, Bob and Doug would have had uh, the ability to do so. Uh, if the winds were stronger and they caught the parachutes, it could certainly create a condition where the capsule could be moved unintentionally by those dragging parachutes. So definitely want to avoid that. So uh, that's one of the, the few buttons that are hardwired into the cabin for the crew. And again, right now we're 20 minutes uh, for the, the main recovery vessel, the Go Navigator, to reach Dragon. By that point, all the rigging will be affixed, and then they'll be able to use the A-frame hydraulic lift on the back of the on the back of the vessel to begin to pull Dragon up out of the water. Uh, Bob and Doug did report they're seeing the guys climbing around outside their window on the capsule, getting that rigging affixed. Uh, still doing good uh, from all of their reports. And we're just going to see the vessel continue to close in. It's a little over 1.3 nautical miles still away, but you can see things starting to sharpen up in our view as it does draw in closer. 
One thing I didn't get to mention as the sequence events was happening, everything was going so quickly, uh, just before the drogue de deployment, the seats automatically rotated to about 26 degrees. Uh, and so if you think back to when we saw Bob and Doug while they were still on orbit and during the, uh, the deorbit burn and all their departure burns, they were actually laying closer to on their backs at the 40 degree position, uh, where essentially they were looking up at the top of Dragon Capsule, like their stomachs were facing uh, the top nose cone there. At this point, the seats would have rotated, so they're in a little bit more of an upright position. Uh, that's done to ensure that um, the loads experienced from landing are, you know, don't, doesn't, doesn't hurt them. So uh, at this point, they are not really laying on their backs in the ocean. They are seated upright a little bit, which would allow them to have a better view of the team working to install the rigging equipment. So at this point, we're at about 22 minutes until Dragon will be lifted onto the recovery vessel. Bob and Doug are still strapped into their seats, kind of like an airplane. You know, they say, do not unbuckle your seatbelt until the captain determines that it's safe to do so. Uh, they will stay, remain in their seats throughout the entire recovery process, essentially until it's time to get them out. Like I said, we are expecting to lift Dragon onto the Go Navigator recovery ship in about 21 minutes. And then in 28 minutes, we will be opening that hatch and beginning crew egress, also known as exit. And we did hear the rigging is pretty much complete. so. Uh, right as they arrive there at the capsule, the main recovery vessel will be able to begin uh, getting that up out of the water. So now as the recovery vessel Go Navigator is getting closer to Dragon, Dragon's position there off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, we're able to see the capsule in a little bit more detail. Uh, it is certainly no longer a bright shade of white. <laughs> like we said, those external temperatures uh, were reaching up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So the thermal protective systems, thermal protection systems, uh, enable Dragon to return while keeping the internal temperature rather temperate. And you are seeing a few more boats than expected. Um, the team's currently working uh, with a few private vessels uh, in the area, making sure that they get out of there. And now we see one of the SpaceX fast boats moving in. So 
So we are being advised that uh, the recovery team is radioing out to the vessels in the water near Crew Dragon to vacate the area uh, so that we're able to extract Bob and Doug safely. Uh, you know, also for the safety of those folks in the area as well, not just Bob and Doug. Yeah, this is, this is obviously a dynamic operation. One of the first things we do is make sure there aren't essentially poisonous fumes around the capsule. So uh, something like this just really can endanger the whole thing, endanger the crew members and endanger themselves. So uh, the SpaceX team is moving in to try and get them away so they can safely recover the Dragon capsule and get Bob and Doug on deck and safely inside the their medical quarters. So we can see them, they're getting a lot closer. Uh, we expect uh, about 10 minutes or so until they should be in position. Uh, all the rigging has been affixed on the Dragon capsule. And once they arrive, they'll be able to use that hydraulic lift to get Dragon up and out of the water. So the recovery vessel Go Navigator is getting closer and closer to Dragon Endeavor as it awaits its recovery, f or as it awaits to be hoisted out of the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we landed just off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. Maybe next time we shouldn't announce our landing zone. <laughs> Oh, there we got a shot from our WB-57 plane. It looks like that area has cleared out significantly, so that is good to see. And we're also hearing that all of the parachutes have buoys on them, so also good news uh, as the recovery process continues for SpaceX Demo 2. Dragon SpaceX for comm reconfig. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, Doug, we're about to uh, reconfigure the forward link. We uh, may lose that for about one or so minutes, uh, and that should happen shortly. Copy. Yeah, just give us a call back when you think we got it back. Will do. So as the main vessel gets closer, it's gonna back up and get its hydraulic lift set up right next to the Dragon capsule, still in the water. Uh, Bob and Doug still inside, uh, just waiting for that recovery. Uh, we should start the hoisting operations in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And then it'll be a pretty quick uh, lift up out of the water using that hydraulic lift into the Dragon nest on the deck of the boat, or the ship rather. Uh, and then they'll move it underneath the helipad into essentially the crew recovery area where they'll have a platform right up to the hatch. They'll be able to open up the hatch. Uh, SpaceX uh, medical doctor will be the first one through the door, able to do a quick check in with Bob and Doug on their status. And then he and the other uh, medical doctors, flight surgeons and uh, trained technicians will begin to help them out of the capsule. Yeah, earlier, just after splashdown, we did hear uh, Bob and Doug report that they were feeling good after re-entry, so uh, that was relayed to the flight surgeon, and good news to hear. Again, this is a view coming from the WB-57 plane uh, as it is circling the area, and we can see Dragon awaiting to be pulled out of the water. Again, we are anticipating that lift uh, to begin in just under 15 minutes. We're approaching 14 minutes here. Uh, and then in 21 minutes, we will have an open hatch. <laughs> and you can see the main recovery vessel in the top right there. That's the helipad with uh, the big SpaceX X on top. It's now backing up towards the capsule. Certainly not to be confused with one of our uh, landing drone ships. <laughs> There's a live view of Dragon, uh, of Dragon floating in the water there in the background, along with many onlookers. <laughs> 
certainly from a safer distance at this point. Uh, this is a live shot coming from Go Navigator, our rec primary recovery vessel here. So it's dra Crew Dragon is also accompanied by the fast boats that are helping to bring it in closer. Um, and there you can see a couple of the recovery team members on the deck. Uh, and also just behind them, we get our first good view of the nest. Uh, yes, so this is uh, essentially the nest in the background there. Dragon will be hoisted using the hydraulic lift out of the water and into that nest. That nest will then be pulled towards the camera from this view, towards those individuals on that upper deck there. Uh, and that's where the... Dragon SpaceX com check. Loud and clear, solo, how us? Loud and clear as well. And from the video, it looks like the boat is about one uh, length away, about five to 10 meters backing up to you. Copy that. Uh, thanks for the update. All right, so good news there. We're getting ready to see Dragon to be lifted out of the water and into the recovery nest. As I was saying, that nest will be pulled towards the camera. Uh, towards that upper deck that we saw there, and that's where the medical stretchers will be waiting uh, to assist them into the medical bays for uh, evaluation after capsule egress. It's already been it's already been 25 minutes since they splashed down. It doesn't feel like it. That uh, but was definitely the fastest 25 yeah, minutes of the day. <laughs> the, the timeline we were anticipating was for the lifting operations to start within about 30 minutes, so we're pretty much right on the timeline mm -hmm. still. That's been a a pretty common thing so far today. Uh, you can see them uh, with one of the fast boats getting it positioned to start uh, moving out with the additional rigging uh, to affix to the Dragon capsule where they're gonna use this A-frame to pull it up out of the water. And you can see the Dragon nest at the very bottom. It's uh, that circular object uh, with the A-1 right on it. So while this is the first time we are recovering a capsule with crew members on board, the recovery team has been... And Dragon, just letting you know, we got a couple lines connected and uh, rigging is in progress. Copy that, SpaceX, thank you. All right there, so just updating the crew that they might feel some uh, momentum as the lines, as a couple of the rigging lines are attached. Uh, there we can actually, there's our first good shot of the individual who is uh, placing that rigging equipment. Equipment Again, that's someone that's highly specialized and very well trained for these operations. Uh, as I was saying, the recovery team has rehearsed and practiced this with Bob and Doug themselves, actually, uh, in a test capsule, practicing the, the egress as well as um, they have recovered, or excuse me, they have practiced the recovery process many times uh, and actually through those practice runs, uh, they have effectively cut the recovery period in half from the initial Demo-1 mission. So uh, it's really nice to see that uh, the, the process itself, after being rehearsed and carefully choreographed, uh, is, is going super efficiently. Again, uh, safety is the number one priority, so making sure that only uh, personnel involved in active recovery operations are present on uh, you may have heard us mention before that there are about 40 people on board today, but we certainly don't want uh, anyone in danger or, or to fall overboard. <laughs> that guy intentionally jumped. <laughs> Speaking of falling overboard. <laughs> We're ready. Thank you. All right, so the crew was just told in about 30, in the next 30 seconds, they have the lines affixed, so they're gonna start lifting the capsule up out of the water. And at this point, the communication we're getting with Dragon is actually being routed through the boat itself at this point. So there we can see the lift. Dragon is out of the water. Yeah, so they're now- that a is gonna start swinging it back and it's bound right for that nest at the bottom of your screen. So there we're getting a better shot of all the points in which Dragon is tethered to the hydraulic lift, ensuring that it isn't swinging freely. Completing final checks and preparing to translate you to the egress platform. Happy. Thank you. 
So for the first time in two months, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley are on some sort of ground. I guess we can't call it solid ground because it is a ship. However, uh, it is the first time that they are not in space, uh, on a rocket, or bobbing in the ocean. Yeah, so now that they're in the nest, we're, they're going to start translating it forward. And Dragon's going to move into essentially the hangar section underneath that helipad and then up to that recovery platform that we saw a little bit earlier. At that point, uh, the spacecraft technicians will work to open up the hatch. As we said previously, it's a manual process uh, with a couple of different uh, attachments you have to engage before the hatch itself can be open. They'll get it opened and then uh, SpaceX's Anil Menon will be the first one through the hatchway to check in on Bob and Doug, get their initial health assessment, see if they're ready to move, and then we'll start assisting them out of the capsule and into that medical facility on the boat. So at this point, the recovery is doing uh, final securing of the capsule in preparation to actually move the recovery nest uh, into closer to the interior of the ship. It'll actually be uh, in a little bit of a covered deck there. We, had a, we saw that camera view earlier uh, looking straight out from the center of the boat. So once Dragon is secured in the nest, uh, the nest will be translated then forward and uh, closer to the recovery uh, the, the, excuse me, closer to the position in which we're able to actually open the hatch. So while Dragon is on board safely, uh, we're not able to do that just yet. Yeah, they're, de they're working to detach some of those lines that were used to hoist it using the A-frame, and uh, we heard that they should be done with that in just a moment, and then we'll start that translation. So right now we can see the recovery team uh, releasing those securing lines that were used during the lift of the capsule from the water uh, into the nest. So they are releasing those securing lines from the sides, making sure it is secure from the bottom. And there we see Dragon moving forward. Look at that. Smooth as a Tesla, I would say. <laughs> it's really interesting to see those scorching marks uh, now that we get a really nice up close detail shot of Dragon. Standing by for the go for side hatch open. That rounded square there in the center of the capsule is that side hatch. And on either side are those oval windows. Dragon SpaceX, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. Happy, we're ready. All right, crew got the call. We are go for hatch open. And if you look closely immediately above the hatch, you can see the area where you can see them working in now. That's where those drogue chutes deployed from. The two circles on either side were where the mortars were. Uh, the main parachutes uh, now hidden by the platform underneath the, the side hatch. So the crew is in the process of removing the side hatch. 
we can see that Go Navigator is in transit. It is making its way back to the Pensacola Naval Air Station. However, Bob and Doug will get a ride from the recovery vessel via helicopter. Uh, So again, we're preparing to open the side hatch, and once that, done, once that is done, the flight surgeon will pop his head in, do an initial check, see how Bob and Doug are doing. And Dragon SpaceX, we've got a slight delay due to some uh, potential NTO hits near the side hatch. Captain Mike, we're uh, standing by. And so they're still continuing to do kind of those sniffs, so checking for any vapors or anything. So those NDO, it's uh, NO2 nitrogen dioxide, uh, primarily can uh, get detected in the air from the burning of fuel. So they're gonna continue to just inspect around the capsule, make sure that it's, again, safe for the crew, safe for the recovery experts uh, before they get this hatch open. But again, moving right along the timeline, it's, uh, since they splashed down at 11.48 uh, a.m. Pacific. And so again, they're just pausing the operations for a moment, doing some additional air sampling uh, around the prop system. We still have uh, telemetry being fed from the vehicle. So flight controllers here in Hawthorne able to monitor prop tanks, propulsion tank pressures, and not seeing any issues with those at the moment. So again, just a short pause in the operations is again, they're just sniffing around the capsule, making sure we don't have uh, any readings that might indicate a fuel leak or anything around the vehicle. Uh, they did detect some NDO, some nitrogen dioxide, which is typically a residue that uh, arises from the burning of fuel. So they're continuing to do just a couple of different air readings, uh, grab samples essentially, uh, before they proceed with the hatch opening. And Dragon SpaceX update, we're still investigating. Uh, looks like we'll be setting up a service section purge. We're working on an ETA for you. Okay. In case if you're just joining us, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley have safely returned from the International Space Station. They made an on-time splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida at uh, 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 18.48 a.m. Universal Time. And they have been pulled out of the water and hoisted onto the recovery vessel Go Navigator. And right now the team is uh, 
just completing, uh, they did a, a, an initial check and found that there might be some remnant, remnant vapors, uh, which we certainly don't want to be around when uh, we have Bob and Doug coming out of the capsule. So the team is uh, working to purge the service section in preparation uh, for crew egress. Just a little commentary on uh, the hatches that, that we're, we've been talking about. So while Dragon's top hatch is used to connect to the International Space Station, uh, that's the one that's located under the nose cone, which is currently hidden there uh, at the top of the capsule. Um, uh, before, the, this is the, the side hatch is what is utilize, utilized for uh, ingress and egress, both on the launch pad as well as coming up here on the recovery vessel. When the international, or excuse me, when the capsule is docked to the International Space Station, uh, they will use the forward hatch to exit and enter the capsule. Something to note that once that side hatch is opened, uh, it'll be the first time that Bob and Doug have gotten a breath of fresh air. Uh, the first time that they've been able to do so in two months uh, since they boarded the Falcon 9. Uh, at the start of their mission back on May 30th. Yeah, with an on-time splashdown, they returned with almost exactly 64 days in space on this mission, just a few minutes shy of that. Um, so I know they're looking forward to it, uh, for at a minimum, in a little bit more of a stable condition now that they're on the boat, not in the water. Uh, but again, our team's just continuing to step through. They're, they're reporting that they're seeing uh, all of the vapor levels that they initially detected have been dropping um, in that service and section purge. Dragon uh, SpaceX, uh, we showed that levels are declining, but are uh, continuing with purge. Copy. Uh, and in addition, just so you know, we are not seeing any, you know, leak indications or anything like that. These are pretty small levels, but we still need to do the purge at this time. Okay, Kathy. Yeah, you're reading our mind, Mike. We were just wondering if you saw any indications of a leak or some depressurization somewhere, but it sounds like it's just uh, part of the deal. Yeah, that's a good read back, Doug. So we're just continuing to get a view down uh, right at the hatch of the capsule. They are detecting those very small traces uh, of a couple of the hypergalls. Um, the one we've heard specifically mentioned was uh, NDO or NO3 uh, nitrogen or NO2 nitrogen dioxide. Um, they are at very low levels, um, obviously not at a very harmful level as we still have people in close proximity to the capsule. Uh, they are going through with the purge. They're not seeing any indications of a leak uh, in the service section of Dragon. That's where uh, pretty much all of those different fuel tanks uh, with the hypergalls are located uh, inside the capsule. And we are just about 44 minutes post splashdown, uh, actually still ahead of the timeline, as we weren't expecting to get the hatch open until shortly before 60 minutes, uh, at which point we'd be bringing Bob and Doug out. So uh, this and service Dragon section- SpaceX, another update. The service section purge should begin in a bit under five minutes. Uh, right now we're showing NTO about two X of our personnel exposure limits. And uh, we're hoping once we start the purge, it'll drop down for us. Okay, thanks, Mike. And I'm going to have to correct myself. So it's NTO, that's the dinitrogen te 
tetraoxide, and that's one of the hypergolic fuels used inside Dragon for powering those uh, Draco thrusters. So again, the SpaceX engineers detecting uh, levels of NTO, it's dinitrogen tetraoxide. It's one of the hypergolic fuels used inside the Dragon spacecraft. Um, levels higher than they would like, um, so they're essentially doing a purge to help uh, dissipate any vapors in and around the service section where those fuel tanks reside in the Dragon capsule. We're expecting that to take within the next five minutes or so. Uh, we were still expecting the crew out inside of an hour, so still on the timeline or a few minutes ahead, and we should be seeing Bob and Doug, uh, once we see those uh, levels continue to drop around the capsule, they'll begin to step through the hatch opening process once again. So right now we're getting ready to purge the service section. Uh, this is to make sure that uh, the lingering NTO fumes that the team is detecting uh, get flushed out essentially. Uh, the service section is not the interior cabin where Bob and Doug are. Uh, it's actually the part of the capsule that is outside of the place where Bob and Doug are. It's, it's external to the, to the cabin but it's inside the capsule itself. So you can think of it as the space between the exterior of the Dragon capsule and the interior space uh, where Bob and Doug are. There's, the, I think the interior pressure vessel, essentially. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Bob and Doug are fine. The air that they are breathing um, is you know, that nitrox uh, mix that they've been getting throughout the entire duration of, of, of today's uh, operations, but it'll be essentially the area below their cabin, um, completely sealed off from the service section. Yeah, that service section is where uh, we, there's a lot of telemetry. It's where um, there are the prop tanks, and we're just making sure that those get aerated so that uh, lingering fumes are swept away. Again, they had detected higher levels than they want to see of nitrogen tetraoxide. Uh, that's one of the two hypergolic fuels used uh, in Dragon, the other one being monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, those two fuels, uh, essentially when thrown together, even without an ignition source, uh, will react. Uh, that's what makes them hypergolic fuels. A uh, much simpler, more elegant uh, solution used in a lot of um, on-orbit maneuvering systems uh, in spacecraft. So again, we're just standing by. So as you can see on your screen, there is one crew member that has kind of what looks like a... Dragon SpaceX, uh, don't have a great, a huge update for you. Just letting you know the service section uh, purge is still in work. Um, uh, 
and we'll try to get you out of there shortly. Traffic. So as I was saying, two individuals on your screen there, one uh, with a face mask and what looks like a scuba tank there uh, with some clean breathing air. Um, there might be another crew member with the same personal protective equipment or PPE that will come on deck here. Uh, that type of equipment, ah, there we go. Uh, that's the kind of equipment that is required in order to perform this purge. Again, uh, the NTO is, the fumes from that are toxic. And of course, we want to keep all crew members safe as we prepare the side hatch for opening in order to let Dragon Bob and SpaceX. Doug egress. Uh, looks like limits uh, are dropping and getting pretty good. Uh, we're still continuing with the purge just to be extra sure. Okay, that sounds good, Mike. Thank you. All right, so we just heard the call, the limits continuing to drop uh, on that uh, that NTO, that nitrogen uh, tetraoxide. So they're just gonna continue to monitor those. They're doing a purge, essentially flushing the air around the service section where the tanks uh, for those hypergolic fuels are in Dragon. Uh, as Kate was talking about, they're not inside the pressure vessel, the section of the Dragon interior where Bob and Doug and their atmosphere exists. Uh, they're essentially outside the pressure vessel, but still inside the outer shell of the Dragon spacecraft. We are just about 52 minutes post splashdown. Again, we're just waiting for them to get good readings on the levels of any hypergol vapors still in existence around the capsule, and then they'll be able to step back in uh, to this hatch opening. Now, we did hear confirmation that they haven't seen any indication of leaks through the telemetry they're still receiving from the Dragon capsule. And so, Dragon SpaceX, we're going to purge for one more minute. Copy. There we go. Should be one more minute. And then, if levels have dropped sufficiently, we'll be able to step back in to the hatch opening process. Bob and Doug will be getting assistance from the recovery teams while exiting Dragon Endeavor. Uh, this is the same process for any returning long duration crew members uh, as returning to a gravity rich environment can, you know, be a little jarring, wreak havoc with our vestibular system. So, uh, which is responsible for maintaining balance and motion. Of course, as you've heard us say multiple times earlier, uh, safety is our number one priority with this operation. So you will see both Bob and Doug helped out of the capsule and assisted to just the few feet over to the medical quarters uh, aboard the boat. Yeah, if, if you've ever watched long duration crews return on a Soyuz, it's pretty similar process where they're literally carried out of the capsule and immediately placed down into a waiting chair where they usually get some initial medical checks out there in the field before they're then carried to and inflate them.
the capsule itself into those medical quarters. And then once they're in there, they'll get some initial checkouts uh, from their flight surgeons who are on location on the boat with them. These are the people that have essentially been responsible for their health and well-being throughout their mission, uh, both beforehand, all of their pre-flight data takes, uh, offering them support uh, in the lead up to launch, uh, and then the entire time while on board the International Space Station. And then they're right here with the front line, with the recovery teams, ready to welcome them home. So it's been just about a minute since we heard that last call to the crew. We should be just about done with the purge. We're gonna stand by and hopefully we'll resume these hatch opening operations in just a moment. Dragon SpaceX for update. Okay, exterior, we're seeing uh, three parts per million NTO and six parts per billion of uh, MMH. And Nil, however, is asking that you uh, de-stow your driggers and take a sample inside the cabin. Yeah, which detector, what number, Mike? Yeah, it'll be uh, detectors two and three in location 14. Copy. Okay, thanks, Doug. All right, so we just got the, the call out of the current readings of both uh, the NTO, the nitrogen tetroxide, and the monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, either in the parts per million or the parts per billion, but just as an extra safety precaution, uh, we heard Anil, so Anil Menon, the uh, medical authority from SpaceX on the boat, asking the crew to take out some uh, air detectors that they have inside with them just to do some quick sampling inside the cabin itself. So again, we've said it before, we'll continue to say it throughout safety, the top priority with this operation. So the teams are going to be very methodical and make sure that everything is in a good setup, a safe environment, uh, not only for the crew themselves, but also for our recovery forces. Uh, but for now, Bob and Doug still inside of Crew Dragon. It's 58 minutes post landing. Dragon with a status. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, for uh, NO2 on detector two, it reads 0, 0.0. And on detector three, it also reads 0, 0.0 for MMH. Okay, great news. 0, 0.0 for detectors two and three for NO2 and MMH. Thank you very much. That's a good copy. And so Doug Hurley reporting zeros across the board, no traces uh, of either the NTO or the MMH.
Snapdragon SpaceX for a status update. It's, um, are below limits, but the purge is actually doing a pretty good job. We saw NTO go from uh, three parts per million down to 1.5 over the last few minutes. So ideally, with a lot of caution, we'd go ahead and let the purge run for a little bit longer, but we want to see how you guys are doing, if you're okay with uh, continuing with, a, with the uh, purge versus uh, knock it off and uh, get you guys out of there quickly. Yeah, we're fine to hang it out, Mike. Uh, no, no problem here. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. We'll uh, keep working the purge to uh, get us down, and uh, and uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, let's just keep everybody safe. No reason to rush. Yeah, we concur. Reporting the crew still doing well in Dragon, so they are good to continue to hang out. The medical authority there on the boat recommending uh, as long as the crew is okay and still doing well inside Dragon, they'll just continue with the purge, trying to get those uh, trace readings of any hypergol vapors all the way down to zero. Because again, we're